The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. My dear Holmes, I know you're a stormy petrel and the puzzles follow you like night to day. But this is obviously a matter of petty housebreaking, pure and simple. Watson, I quite agree with your diagnosis of housebreaking, but it is neither pure nor simple. And I fear it may yet prove to be simply deadly. <laughs> Mystery drama, The Rygate Mystery, was adopted especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Bennett and stars Gordon Gould. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Sherlock Holmes fans, and who isn't? are accustomed to following the great detective into every imaginable situation. In and out of handsome cabs, on railroad stations, on the underground, on the Thames, in wild boat chases. But the last place you'd expect to find him is in a hospital room, suffering from nervous exhaustion. Good morning, Watson. Oh, why are you up, Holmes? I gave you a sedative last night. I should have had you sleeping till noon. Indeed you did. Oh, what happened? You know my methods, Watson. Reason it out. Uh, you didn't take it. Excellent, Watson. Oh, you really incorrigible, Holmes. <laughs> I must... First, tell me, are you visiting me as a physician or as a friend? Both. But as your physician, I must insist that you follow my instructions. Now, why didn't you take the sedative? Because I'm feeling perfectly fit. Well, as your friend, I rejoice. As your physician, I disagree. You must admit, Holmes, that even your iron constitution broke down under the strain of unraveling the colossal schemes of the Netherlands Sumatra Company, and you need rest. I trust you're not prescribing a longer stay here in hospital. Oh, no, not at all. Mm. I know you. This is no place for you to get the rest you require. How does a week in the country strike you? Where? Surrey. With my old friend from Afghanistan, Colonel Hater. And his household? Oh, a bachelor establishment home. Ah. No one to fuss over you except your friend and physician. <laughs> it will be ideal. Rest is your prescription, and rest I shall have. Just make arrangements to have me discharged from this hospital. And so it was we came to Colonel Hater's house near Rygate in Surrey and walked straight into what at first blush seemed a petty problem. Shortly after dinner, I insisted upon an early bedtime because of Holmes' condition. But our host said... Oh, by the by, I think I'll take a pistol from my collection upstairs with me, in case we have an alarm. An alarm, Colonel Hayter? Exactly. We've had a scare in this part lately. Old Acton, who's one of our county magnates, had his house broken into last Monday. Oh, no great damage done. But the thieves are still at large. No clue? No, none as yet. Oh, but after your great international affair, this must seem small potatoes to you, Mr. Holmes. I quite agree with you, Hater. I suppose there were no features of interest? No, I fancy not. <laughs> the thieves ransacked the library and got very little for their pains. It might even have been vandals. What makes you think that, Colonel? Well, it seems obvious to me. The whole place was turned upside down, drawers broken open, presses ransacked, and uh, the result is a, 
Standard, volume of pokes, homer, two-plated candlesticks, and ivory leatherweight, a small oak barometer, and a ball of twine are all that the thieves took. What an extraordinary assault, man. Yes, that's why I say, Vandals. The county police ought to be able to make something of that. Why, surely it's obvious that... Uh, 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 my dear fellow, you're here for a rest. Now, for heaven's sake... Don't get started on a new problem when your nerves are still shaky. You've made your point, Watson. I shall be a good patient and get along to bed. Hater and I were down early to breakfast. And I was pleased to see that Holmes was sleeping late. When suddenly, the butler rushed in agitatedly. Have you heard the news, Colonel? At the Cunninghams? Uh, that the murder. Oh, my word. Oh, who was killed? Uh, J.P. or son? Neither, sir. It was William the coachman. Shot through the heart, sir. Who shot him? Well, a burglar, sir. Then ran off and got clean away. Oh, it's a bad business. Huh? A bad business. Good morning, gentlemen. What's a bad business? Well, oh, Holmes. Good morning. Uh, you may go, Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins just told us about a murder over the Cunninghams. Cunningham? Yes, the leading light in the county. Mm, justice of peace and all that. The decent fellow. He was murdered. Oh, no, 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 no. Not Cunningham. His coachman caught a burglar in the act and got shot for protecting his master's property. Huh. Evidently the same villain who spoke into actions and stole that very singular collection. Yeah, precisely. Uh, now, Holmes, you promise. Well, back to conversation, Watson. Mm, this tea is excellent. Mm, it does appear to me just a trifle curious. A gang of burglars or one burglar operating in the county might be expected to vary the scene of their operation and not crack two cribs in the same district within a few days. Yes, well, not if they were local fellows. Ah, in that case, Actings and Cunninghams are just the places to go, for they're far the largest around here. And riches? Uh, they ought to be. Uh, but they've had a lawsuit going for some years, which has sucked the blood out of both of them. Acton has some claim on Cunningham's estate, and all the lawyers have been at it with both hands. Really, Holmes, I I think we should change the conversation before. All right, Watson. If it's a local villain, there shouldn't be too much difficulty in running him down. And I don't intend to meddle. Inspector Forrester, sir. Good morning, Colonel. I hope I don't intrude, but we heard that Mr. Holmes of Baker Street is here. Ah, Inspector. Yes, he he sits across from me now. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you don't mind, we could do with a bit of assistance. (laughs) The fates are against you, Watson. We were chatting about the matter when you arrived. Perhaps you can fill me in on some of the details. Gladly. We had no clue in the act in robbery, but here we have plenty to go on. And there's no doubt that it was the same party in each case. The man was seen. Ah, by whom? The Cunninghams, father and son. The elder Mr. Cunningham saw him from the bedroom window. And young Mr. Alec saw him from the back passage. What time was this? Oh, a quarter to twelve. Mr. Cunningham had just gotten to bed. And Mr. Alec was in his dressing gown smoking a pipe. And? Well, they heard William, the coachman... Crying out for help, Mr. Alec ran down to aid William. The back door was open, and as he reached the foot of the stairs, he saw two men struggling. One of them fired a shot. The other dropped, and the killer rushed across the garden and over the hedge. And there was no pursuit. Mr. Alec stopped to see if he could help William. So the killer got clean away. Hmm. Any descriptions? Only the gym old Mr. Cunningham got from the window. Beyond the fact that he was a middle-sized man and dressed in some dark material, nothing. Hmm. And what was William doing there at that time of night? Did he say anything before he died? Uh, not a word. Do you have any theories? Well, the action robbery has put everyone on guard. William lived at the lodge with his mother, and since he was a very faithful fella, I imagine he walked up to check the house and... Well, came upon this robber just as he burst through the door. Burst through? Oh, the lock had been forced. Did William say anything to his mother before going out? Well, she's very old and very deaf. I'm afraid the shock has thrown her into complete senility. Okay. If that's all, there are a few small matters I should like to examine. Oh, there's one other thing, Mr. Holmes. This piece of paper was found between the finger and thumb of the dead man. 
It appears to be a fragment torn from a larger sheet. Mm. May I? Oh, of course, sir. On oh, my word, Inspector. It is extraordinary. There are much deeper waters than I thought. Well, you notice, sir, that the fragment we have read... At quarter to twelve, learn what may be... And that leads you to surmise, Inspector? Well, that it may have been an appointment. The exact time, a quarter to twelve, suggests that. And then that opens up the possibility that William was some kind of accomplice. That's an ingenious and not entirely impossible supposition. But the writing, Inspector, the writing opens up a whole new area of complications which must be explored. Come, Inspector, there's work to be done. And Watson, you and you, Colonel, will have to excuse us. I must say I was a bit put off by being pushed out of the investigation in so cavalier a fashion by Holmes. But Holmes later gave me the reasons for his decision and also filled me in as to what steps he took. His first request was to visit the morgue with Inspector Forrester where he examined the clothes of the murdered coachman. He certainly died from a revolver wound, Inspector. Well, had you doubted it, Mr. Holmes? Ah, it's well to test everything, Inspector. There are some very interesting things about his clothes. Remarkably neat, I should say. And their very neatness tells us a good deal. If you're referring to the fact that it supports my theory that he was there because of the appointment, well, I'll agree with you, sir. That's quite possibly. But more than that, Inspector, much more... What's that, then? I suggest you refer to your notes. I have no doubt that you'll come to the same conclusions as I did. Did he have a wallet? Oh, here. Nothing's been touched. Mm. Two pounds, an identification card, a receipt for some gloves, and... What's this? A photograph of a girl. Uncommonly handsome, I'd say. Oh, she is indeed, sir. Hey, that's, uh, <clears throat> Anne Harrison. His girl? Well, that's hard to say, Mr. Holmes. And he is, uh, well, what you might call a free spirit. Hmm. I think we should visit her. That's not possible. She disappeared a few days ago. Her family's upset. Doesn't know where she is. Have they reported anything? Oh, no, it's not like that. She left a note saying she was going to London and she'd be gone some time. Does she have friends in London? None that we know. Was she still seeing William before she took off to London? Well, it was kind of an off again on again thing. I sort of difficult to explain. Inspector, I think our next step is to visit the scene of the crime. Here we are, Inspector. According to your eyewitnesses, the struggle took place about here. Yes, sir. And now. Now you'll struggle with me. Oh, but Mr. Holmes, Mr. Watson said... Dutch you... man, we'll only stimulate the struggle. Come on. Oh, come on. Remember, this is a matter of life and death. Oh, enough, enough, enough. That should do it. Oh, what are you doing, sir? Examining the ground here. Well, we can see the marks where the struggle took place just a few feet away. Oh, Inspector. But I must base my deductions on facts. And facts must be tested. Come along now. We are finished here. Where to? The King's Arms. Oh, that's a local pub. Oh, I didn't know that. It was the name on the matchbox William Kerwin was carrying. Well, there'll be nothing there but a lot of gossip. Exactly what I'm hoping. A lot of gossip about a free spirit named Anne Harrison. Oh, <laughs> is an expression much used and loved by Gaelic detectives who cling to the belief that at the center of every crime is a woman. However, in the 1,300 pages that constitute the Holmesian saga, it's a rarity to come upon a case where the catalyst of the crime was a woman. Have we made a discovery? We'll find out in Act Two shortly. of the straight man in comedy has been well established. But how about literature? There would have been no Dr. Johnson without Boswell. And in detective fiction, where would Hercule Poirot have been without his Sheridan Hastings? And Sherlock Holmes without Dr. Watson is unthinkable. 
Therefore, it's surprising to find Holmes pursuing clues in a murder investigation without the good doctor at his side. We find him at the Rygate Village pub without Watson. Barney, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes, this is Barney Stapleford, the owner of the King's Arms. Oh, it's an honor, an honor. Oh, I never thought I'd meet the famous Sherlock Holmes in person. Uh, drinks are on the house. Thank you, but it's a little early for me. Mr. Holmes is looking for information about Anne Harrison. Oh, well, that might take some time. Hey, you mind if I sit down? By all means. Uh, well, now, Mr. Holmes, what would you like to know? First, did she come here often? Hmm, if it called two or three times a week, often she did. But then again, there's not much doing in her eye gate. Not for a high-spirited looker like Annie, that is. Oh, no wonder she's off for London. That's where she belongs, if you ask me. Did she have a particular friend among the local gentry? Well, I don't rightly know as you could call them gentry. Although Mr. Acton and young Alec Cunningham are big landowners. But William Kerwin was fair corn on her. And how did she feel about him? Why, same way she felt about anything in trousers. <laughs> she loved him. Oh, come on down, Barney. That's you not... Know, oh, Inspector, you know Annie as well as I do. As I recall, you had a bit of a fling with her yourself. Uh, well, Barney... Uh... That tongue of yours is going to get you into a lot of trouble one of these days. Oh, Inspector. Nothing wrong with what our host has been saying. All I gather is that Anne Harrison engenders warm feelings in the opposite sex. Uh, she was trouble. That's how she came to meet the Inspector here. He was called in to break up a brawl between Alex Cunningham and Mr. Rackman. And there you go again, Barney. It was simply a loud argument, not a brawl. Over Miss Harrison? Ah. Uh, she seemed to have gotten her dates mixed up, and, uh, <laughs> Mr. Holmes, she did seem to enjoy the fracas. When was Miss Harrison last in here? Oh, I just remember exact date. But I do know she was with William. Must have been about a fortnight ago. Then that would have been before the burglary at Mr. Acton's, wouldn't it? That's right, sir. Just about before that time. <laughs> When Holmes returned with Inspector Forrester, he looked drawn and pale, and I insisted he go up to his room and rest. I took this opportunity to try to find out from the Inspector what progress he and Holmes had made with the case. Well, it's no use asking me any more questions, Doctor. Mr. Holmes is behaving very queerly. Makes me simulate a struggle, break through hedges, and I told you about his interest in village gossip. Well, no need to alarm yourself, Inspector. I found that there's usually method in his madness. Well, some folks might say there was madness in his message. It's not the first time we've heard that from the police, eh, Watson? Oh, I'd hoped you'd rested longer, Holmes. You really should. Nonsense, dear friend. Your prescription did wonders for me. Inspector... I think we'd do well if we had a talk with Anne Harrison. Every effort should be made to locate her in London. Begging your pardon, Mr. Holmes, but I don't see the young lady as a key in this murder. We know for a fact that she was well away before William Cohen was shot. And well away just before the Acton house was ransacked. What coincidence, probably. Had she ever gone to London before? Not to my knowledge. I prefer dealing with facts, not coincidences, Inspector. The facts are the Acton house was robbed. The Cunningham coachman murdered. Both families are involved in a lawsuit, and members of both families have evinced a strong interest in Anne Harrison, who, coincidentally, is also deeply involved with William Kerwin, the murdered coachman. I take it that you attach no great importance to the scrap of paper found in the dead man's hand. You take it wrongly, Inspector. Whoever wrote that note was responsible for bringing William Kerwin out of his bed and perhaps to his death. How did William get the note? Was it delivered by hand, or did it come to the post? When I made inquiries, William received a letter by the afternoon post yesterday. The envelope was destroyed. Excellent, Inspector. Now, we agree that this is part of a sheet of paper torn out of the dead man's hand. Why was someone so anxious to get possession of it? Well, because it might incriminate him. Exactly. And what would he do with it once he'd gotten hold of it? Oh, well, I have no idea. Oh, I told you the ground was searched thoroughly in the hope of finding him. No, Inspector. If our deductions are correct so far, our criminal was in a desperate hurry. 
He is not likely to have stopped to dispose of it. And we can buttress this line of reasoning by noting that he was in such a rush, he overlooked the piece left in William Kerwin's hand. Oh, very true, sir, very true. But how does that help us decide what he did with it? The most likely thing, he thrust it into his pocket. If we could get the rest of that sheet, we'd have gone a long way towards solving the mystery. Well, I've heard you were a miracle worker, Mr. Holmes. But how do we get to the criminal's pocket before we catch the criminal? On this, Inspector, exactly the same way you make an omelet without breaking eggs. After the inspector had left, not without giving Holmes a very strange look and promising to meet again with Holmes later in the day, I had questions to put to my old friend. Inspector Forrester is quite good, Watson, but he is inclined to rush things without examining the facts very closely. As a matter of fact, Holmes, uh, he was complaining about your methods as being time wasters. And for the life of me, I I couldn't explain to him why you insisted on making sure that William Cowan had indeed been shot. I never questioned that for a moment, my dear fellow. Oh, but, but then, think, uh, Watson, think. What were we told? Why, uh, that the man was shot. Of course. And? And uh, that the intruder or the killer ran off and escaped. Before that, Watson, before that. Uh, oh, before mm-hmm. that. Uh, uh, well, there was a struggle. Excellent. Now, bring to bear your knowledge as a physician. Two men are struggling. One, presumably, has a gun. Suddenly, a shot. A man falls. The other runs away. What, as a physician, would you expect to find on the body of the corpse? Mm, powder burns, of course. Exactly. But, Watson, not only were there no powder burns on the body, neither could I find any on the clothes that William Kerwin had on him when he was shot. Good heavens. Did you tell this to Inspector Forrester? Oh, I tried to point it out to him, but he's off on another scent. You, uh, you promised to tell me about the note, and why you were so positive that Anne Harrison hadn't written the note. No one person wrote that note, Watson. Uh, what on earth do you mean? No doubt you noted that I made a very careful examination of the corner of the paper which the inspector submitted to us, and it was evident to me that two different people had collaborated on the writing of the note doing alternate words. Oh, but, but why, Holmes? Why in the world would two people go to such lengths to write a note in that fashion? Obviously, the business was a bad one, and one of the writers distrusted the other and was determined that whatever was done, each should have an equal hand in it. Well, then murder must have been a possibility when the note was written. You'll never cease to amaze me, Watson. That is indeed a most excellent deduction. Mm-hmm. And certainly, if not murder... A devilish bit of business. Uh, then, of course, we can throw out the possibility that the burglary, the actions, and this crime were in any way connected. I find it difficult to believe that two crimes such as this, committed within a fortnight of each other, and involving two families who are having a dispute, is merely a coincidence. Particularly when you add the complication of Anne Harrison's involvement with both the families and the murdered man. But, Holmes, what is the connection? What could it be? Watson, if we knew that, we'd know everything. Well, come along. We have an appointment with Inspector Forrester at the scene of the crime. Mr. Holmes, I have moved from London, and it may be important. Was she badly injured? Oh, she's in a hospital, but the doctors say that she'll recover. Oh, hold on. I never said Annie was hurt. How did you? Come, come, Inspector. You have news from London of great importance and interest to me. That news could only concern the young lady, Anne Harrison. Well, that's all very well, but the fact that she was there... I know of your personal interest in the lady, and since you're obviously perturbed and trusted, it could only be that she'd suffered some harm. How did it occur? She was set upon by some thugs, robbed and beaten. But fortunately, they caught the rascals. And they implicated someone from this area? Uh, Not precisely, but they did say they were hired. I see. Do you recall the name of the officer in charge of the case? Well, I'm not sure. It was something that sounded like, um, uh, Lester or Lestrade. Inspector Lestrade. I know him. He's a competent man. And we'll have that sort of information from him soon. But I fear we can't wait. I see you placed a constable by the kitchen door. So let us get to work immediately. If you'd be so kind, Inspector, as to go around the front, 
I'll have the constable open the kitchen door for me to enable me to take some tests. What will you be wanting of me in the front, Mr. Holmes? Times. When I see Dr. Watson appear, I'll want to know the exact time. I'll be waiting, Mr. Holmes. Come along, Watson. Mm-hmm. Throw the door open, if you please, officer. Now, Watson, I'd like you to go up those stairs about halfway and tell me what you can see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With or without my glasses, Holmes? No, I want you to wear them, please. Yeah, that's far enough, Watson. Now tell me, what do you see? Well, I can see the garden quite clearly. Anything else? Oh, yes, a good part of the hedge that lines the road. Anything in particular strike you? Yes, there is a large bush in the garden near the hedge. Stands out clearly. Excellent, Watson. I'd like you to join me now. Oh. Uh, what was that all about, Holmes? It was on those stairs that young Alec Cunningham was standing when he saw the men struggling. Come along outside again. And he saw the fellow get away by crashing through the hedge just to the left of that bush. Now, look up at the house yonder. The second window from the left. That's my father's room. Oh. Then you must be Alec Cunningham. And you must be the famous Sherlock Holmes from London. Thank you. And this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Dr. Watson. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Watson, it seems that our young friend here is acquainted with us. And it is the world, Mr. Holmes. I saw you strolling about here and came to tell you that my father's been so upset by the events of the past few days that he has taken to his bed. I'm sorry to hear that. Anything you want to know, I'll be only too happy to tell you. But I'm sure Inspector Forrester has told you everything you need to know. He's been very cooperative, but there are still some questions to be answered. Not by my father. That won't be necessary. It's obvious that your father could very well have seen the two men struggling from his window, just as you observed them from the stairs. Yes, that's right. And then you ran out and knelt beside the wounded man? Correct. I wonder if you could show us the precise spot. The ground is very hard, you see, and there are no marks to guide us. Yes, if you wish. And although I don't know what good it will do, I thought you were never at a loss. Huh. Yes, right here. Right here is where I knelt on. Ah, just as the inspector told me. You know, Mr. Holmes, you don't seem to be so very quick as you're supposed to be. Oh, well, all of us need a little time. Ah, well, we don't need it. Bumbling around here, I don't see that we have any clue at all. Oh, no, that's not fair. You don't know that if Holmes could only lay his hands on... Oh, good heavens, Mr. Holmes, what's the matter? He's been overdoing it. That's what... Here, help me with him. Gently now. On the ground, Dr. Watson. Oh, together we can carry him into the house. And there, I'm sure he'll come round. What is sometimes overlooked by the devotees of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson is the genuine respect that Holmes had for Watson's ability as a physician. Although Holmes was tolerantly skeptical of Watson's deductive powers, there is no instance in any of the stories where Holmes denigrated Watson's medical skills. That's all to the good. Because it appears that Holmes himself is sorely in need of those skills now. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I don't think anyone can really claim to be a real fan of Sherlock Holmes who isn't also a lover of the English countryside. So many of Holmes' cases taken in Watson to the moors, or to various charming spots in Sussex, Wessex, or as in this case, Surrey, that they are actually tours organized for aficionados, where they can retrace the steps of their favorite sleuth. Here we are in the village of Rygate in Surrey, in the living room of the Cunningham House. I'm most dreadfully sorry, Cunningham. I'm sure I put you to a good deal of inconvenience. A month and Charles, I was worried about you there. You looked rather ghastly. Yeah. Mr. Holmes has only just recovered from a severe illness. I've probably been overdoing, Watson. Shall I send you home in my carriage? Thank you very much, but since I'm here, there's one point I'd like to clear up. Well, what is it? It seems to me to be a distinct possibility that your coachman, William, arrived not before, but after the entrance of the burglar into the house. <laughs> can't see why you think that. The door was forced. The marks were clear, but you and your father take it for granted that the robber never got in. Well, I'd not yet gone to bed, and I'd certainly have heard anyone moving about. Where were you? In my dressing room. Your dressing room? 
Is that the window next to your father's? Yes, it is. Then both of your lamps were lit? <laughs> Undoubtedly, we were both up. That's very curious. Very curious indeed. What are you talking about? The fact that a burglar, and a burglar who had some previous experience, should choose to break into a house when he could see from the lights that two of the family were still awake. Your notion that the man robbed the house before William tackled him is absurd. We should have found the place disarranged and also found things missing. It depends on what the things were. You must remember that we're dealing with a very peculiar burglar who appears to work on minds of his own. For example, look at the queer lot he took from Acton. What was it again? Uh, ball, string, uh, letter weight, another large uh, hand. Thank you, Watson. Well, crime isn't my field, and we're quite in your hands, Mr. Holmes. Anything you suggest will be done. Excellent. In the first place, I should like you to offer a reward. Now, whatever you say. I've jotted down the form here, if you'd be kind enough to sign it. I thought 50 pounds were quite enough. Well, my father and I would be willing to give 500. Here's the form. Oh, well, this isn't quite correct. I wrote it rather hurriedly. Uh, this reads, uh, all right, at about a quarter to one on Tuesday morning, an attempt was made, uh, and so on. Well, it was at a quarter to twelve, as a matter of fact. Oh, my apologies. You're quite correct, of course. I can't think how I happened. To... Oh, this just goes to prove that you're still not yourself. <laughs> and no matter. I'll make the correction. And, Mr. Holmes, get it printed as soon as possible. You may have mistaken the time, but the idea is an excellent one. There you are. Thank you. And now I think we should go over the house together and make sure that this rather erratic burglar didn't carry anything away with him. Let's start with the door here. Mm. Mm. Marks indicate a chisel or a strong knife was used to force the bolt back in. You don't use bars, then, Cunningham? We've never found it necessary. You do keep a dog, though? Yes, but he's chained to the other side of the house. When did the servants go to bed? Usually about ten. Was that also true of William? Yes. It's singular that he should have been up on this particular night. And so Holmes continued his methodical inspection of the architecture of the house, and not without a good deal of grumbling from young Alec Cunningham, who refused to yield when Holmes wanted to go into his father's room. We were in young Cunningham's dressing room, and he offered to let Holmes examine his bedchamber. Holmes accepted. As we entered the room, a carafe of water and a dish of oranges stood near the foot of the bed. <laughs> to my astonishment, as we passed, Holmes deliberately knocked the whole thing over. Now you've done it, Watson. A pretty mess you've made. But Holmes, I never... Uh, oh, well, I suppose I'll try to clean this up. No, here, I'll give you a hand. Uh, my, mind the glass pieces. Well, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, Doctor, but in my opinion, your friend Holmes is off his head. Uh, his behavior may be due to his recent... Hello. Where is he off to now? Well, where is he? Well, I can't have him running around here. Holmes! Holmes, where are you? Help! What the... What the hell? Oh. The wood, would you? What's going on here? Arrest these men, Inspector. Mr. Cunningham and his son. They're the ones. Well, on what charge? Murdering their coachman, William Kerwin. Oh, come now, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure you don't really mean... Cut, man. Look at their faces. Well, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Cunningham. I trust this will prove to be an absurd mistake. This what? is what we really wanted. The remainder of the note. Precisely. Where did you find it? Well, I was sure it must be. I'll explain everything to you presently. Watson, I'll be back with the inspector at Colonel Hater's in time for lunch. And Holmes was as good as his word. He and Inspector Forrester arrived just as the Colonel and I were sitting down. Ah, Mr. Holmes, uh, Dr. Watson has given me the news. I still can't bring myself to believe it. The Colonel Holmes. Are you sure you're not barking up the wrong tree? Oh, I'm afraid he's not, Colonel. Your thoughts were the same as mine. But there's no question Mr. Holmes has gotten the right end of the stick. I wonder how he came to see it is beyond me. Inspector, your handicap was in knowing these important people. You recall that we both agreed immediately upon the importance of the scrap of paper in the dead man's hand. Certainly, but that in itself... Excuse me, Inspector. Alec Cunningham said that the assailant, after shooting Kerwin, 
fled instantly, did he not? Yes. Then it couldn't have been the assailant who had torn the paper from the dead man's hand. And since young Cunningham said he'd knelt by the dead man, and then his father and servants had come upon the scene, therefore the only one who could have snatched the paper had to be Mr. Alec Cunningham. Ah, it's crystal clear, Mr. Holmes. Well, now we just show who was at the time. We had another clue. Remember, Inspector, I called your attention to the condition of William Kerwin's clothes. Because, according to Alec Cunningham's statement, he was shot at close range. But there were no powder burns upon the clothing. It was then that I found myself looking askance at the part which had been played by Mr. Alec Cunningham. But the motive, Holmes. Why would the Cunninghams want to murder their coachman? Exactly, Watson. The question cries out for an answer. I felt all along that the answer would be found in the note that was torn from the dead man's hand. But the question remained, where was that note? Well, my question is, what the devil was a coachman doing in the garden at that time of night if he didn't see a burglar? If you throw out the burglar theory, and I'd already discounted that for reasons which I'll explain shortly, there remains only one answer. He was there to meet someone. But Holmes, uh, I, I thought you were convinced this whole thing started with the burglary at the Acton House. And so it did, with the thieves taking a collection of useless objects which leads to the inescapable conclusion that the robbers didn't find what they were looking for and just took the first things that came to hand to make it appear to be a robbery. Why, I fail to see the connection. And now is the time to refer to the corner of paper the inspector submitted to me. As I told you, Watson, it seemed to be part of a most remarkable document. Well, you said it was written by two people writing alternate words. Wasn't that drawing a rather long bow, Mr. Holmes? Not at all, Inspector. Let me draw your attention to the strong T's of at and to and ask you to compare them with the weak ones of quarter and twelve. And you will instantly recognize the facts. Well, now that you point it out, it seems very clear. But there's much more. You may not be aware that the deduction of a man's age from his writing is one which has been brought to considerable accuracy by handwriting experts. It was simple to deduce that the writers of this note were a young man and a much older one. And there's a further and much subtler point. The handwriting belongs to men who are blood relatives. How oh, come, Mr. Holmes, this almost smacks of witchcraft? So that put you squarely on the trail of the Cunninghams. And the note. I was almost certain that young Alec had torn it out of the dead man's hand and thrust it into the pocket of his dressing gown. Oh, why is this dressing gown, Holmes? Time, Watson. Time. Where else could he put it? Well, at that moment, I'll agree. But why would he not have destroyed it later? He would have, if he had known of its importance. And you, Watson, were about to inform him of that fact when, by the luckiest chance in the world, I tumbled down in a sort of fit and so changed the conversation. Holmes, do you mean to say that that feint of yours was an imposture? Then, when I recovered, I managed to get young Alec to write the word 12 so that I might compare it with the 12 in the paper. Oh, I swear I'll never waste sympathy upon you again, Holmes. <laughs> it was necessary, Watson, just as it was for me to blame you for upsetting the table so that I could get to the dressing gown and find the paper there. Yeah, well, that's all very well, but confound it, I still don't know why the Cunninghams killed the coachman. Colonel, the old man cracked and told us the whole story when he saw how strong a case we had against him. It was pretty much as I had deduced he and his son, Alec, had robbed the Acton house looking for a legal document that would have helped in their lawsuit against Acton. When they failed to find it, they tried to make it appear like an ordinary robbery. Yeah, but where does William come? He witnessed the robbery, and he attempted blackmail. Ah, the Cunninghams think he slipped out and followed them the night of the robbery. But I think otherwise. You have some reason for that, Holmes. The note. Here's the whole text. If you will come around to the East Gate, you will be very much surprised and learn something of the greatest value to you and Annie Harrison. Say nothing to anyone. You think Annie was in on it? Well, let's say that it's entirely possible that she and William Kerwin were out walking the night of the robbery. And after seeing what went on, it's also possible that Annie may have suggested the whole plot to William. However, that's no longer important. And Watson and I want to thank you for the distinct success of our quiet rest in the country. Oliver Steele, the Sheila 
Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson intimately. A tribute to the literary magic of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Yet Doyle left out so many questions in the private lives of his two immortals unanswered. For example, did you know that Watson married a second time? He did, according to a later Holmesian story, but no one knows the name. Simply because Dr. Watson never mentioned it. Well, perhaps therein lies the charm. I'll be back shortly. popularity of the Sherlock Holmes tales may lie in the life of Conan Doyle himself. He is not only a writer, but also a doctor, athlete, dramatist, historian, war correspondent, and spiritualist. But most of all, he was always the helper of the underdog. And that may be his biggest asset. Our cast included Gordon Gould, William Griffiths, Ray Owens, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. All right, all right. Come on, now, settle down, fella. I know you're not too fond of being vague. It's only take a couple of minutes now. Uh, come on, Skeeter, what's this plan of yours? Well, the first thing I have to do is get on the phone to these friends of mine who do the, uh, their racing out in Western Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are they going to tell you? If they happen to have any big geldings, about 16 hands high, racing up there... Peter, I hope you're not thinking what I think you're thinking. And, uh, what might that be, huh? You're looking for a ringer. Ted, we find a horse can pass a proud chief's twin. Except for the fact that this other proud chief can run fast enough to win races. We'll be setting ourselves up for some tidy profits. Peter, you've got to be crazy even to think of trying to pull such a stunt. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by White Westinghouse Appliance Company. This is Tony Grimes, inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant Whenever I go to a museum or art gallery and I see the work of a great artist, a creation of canvas, of a woman of mystery, of beauty, I wonder who were those women, those girls who served as models to the artists. What were their lives like? How did they inspire? And why? Today, Mystery Theatre brings you one such story with uh, an uncanny beginning and a mysterious end. I found Pierre this morning with a pallet knife in his hand. He had fallen across a canvas he was working on. He was dead. But how did he die, Max? Devon, there wasn't a mark on him. His heart just stopped. But such a young man. I was posing for him only yesterday. That painting, it was... Shall I call it? His last act. I don't understand, Max. He had taken his knife and slashed it from top to bottom. And it was as though when he could do no further damage, that his heart failed. I 
drama, Goddess of Death, based on a story by Barry Payne, has been adapted for the Mystery Theater by James Agatunia and stars Diana Kirkwood and Mando Kramer. I shall return shortly with Act One. Yvonne was an extraordinary creature. Her mother had also been an artist model. I'm sure you've seen this extraordinary beauty interpreted on canvases by artists of the first rank. And so had the English painter George Haller. Also, he had heard that Yvonne was not happy with Pierre Maurice, who had hired her to pose for him that winter of 1879. December was very cold in Paris, and Pierre's paintings were not selling well. As George Haller walked upstairs to the top floor, he could hear a woman's voice pleading. Then a man, who he recognized as Pierre Maurice, the painter. The woman must be Yvonne, his mother. There was desperation behind that door. No, Pierre, don't, please, don't point that gun at me. Yvonne, what you are doing is going to be the death of me. I can't sit on it any longer. Pierre, it's me, George Haller. Let me in, will you? Pierre, don't be foolish. If someone is going to die, Yvonne, it won't be me. Pierre, unlock this door. Pierre! Put the gun away, please! Pierre, let me in. I'm breaking the door down, I warn you. Pierre, what have you done? Have you killed her? I... I didn't mean to. I was just uh, trying to frighten her with a gun and it went off. Thank heavens, she's opening her eyes. Mademoiselle, are you hurt? She's not Monsieur. saying anything, but she is breathing. I don't see any wound on her. Monsieur, I... I am all right. But I didn't shoot at her. See, the, the hole is over there. She kicked my arm and the bullet went into the wall over there. Mademoiselle Yvonne, are you all right? It's true, monsieur. Pierre did not shoot me. Here, let me help you to your feet. Oh. You're quite sure now. You have no pain anywhere because I could take you directly to the hospital. No, I didn't mean it. It's been coming over me for a long time. Just to hold on to my arms, mademoiselle. Up we go. Oh. All right. Now, Pierre, give me that gun. I'm... What in heaven's name were you trying to do? Now, give me the pistol. I'm not pointing at anyone. You are not to be trusted with a gun. Just take the girl and go away. What you don't seem to realize in your state of mind is that you might point that thing at yourself, and I won't have that. So give it here. I don't want the horrible thing. Yvonne, I don't know what came out of me. I'm truly sorry. You go away from me. Go away. I wouldn't hurt you for the world. What in heaven's name are you trying to do with a loaded revolver? Well, it's an accumulation. Intense work, work, concentration, and... She, she drove me to it. But I, I wouldn't hurt her, really. Yvonne, can you ever forgive me? Pull out a gun and aim it at someone. You should be put away where you could do no harm. Pierre, you don't know how lucky you are. I am not dead. George, I'm begging you. Get her out of my studio. She's the very devil herself. Yvonne, will you let me see your home? If you like, monsieur. I'm George Heller. I, I, I happened to stop by here hoping I could persuade you to come and pose for me. I'm glad you came when you did. Now, look, Pierre, I want you to lie down. And as soon as I've taken Mademoiselle home, I shall come back and we'll talk. You needn't bother to come back, George. I want to be by myself. I'm through with that witch. I don't care what happens to the painting. I, too, have finished with you, Pierre. But pay me the 50 francs for the past week's work. As for posing for you, Monsieur Haller, I, I, I don't know. I must, I must take a rest. This has been very upsetting. I never dreamed being an artist's model could be such a dangerous profession. Well, as a rule, it isn't, I assure you. Something has happened to Pierre. Get out. Get out, the both of you. Well, I'm sane enough to understand what I'm doing. George, you want her to model for you? Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Having her for a model will be the biggest mistake you have ever made. Mademoiselle Yvonne? Au revoir, Pierre. 
Perhaps I'll drop by tomorrow and we'll talk to him. Don't bother. I don't want to see you again. I don't know what's happened tonight, mademoiselle. And what's more, I don't wish to know. Will you meet me tomorrow? At Le Deux Magots? We will have some food and wine and discuss whether you wish to pose for me and the painting I have in mind. Well, all right. Tomorrow, 12? But please, I can get home all right alone. The metro goes right by my door. Tomorrow, then. 12 o'clock at the cafe. Mm -hmm. That was my first meeting with Yvonne. Unusual? Highly. Did I save her life? I'm not sure. Would Pierre have fired a second time and perhaps killed her if I hadn't broken down the door? I arrived at the Demago at quarter to twelve, opened a newspaper and began to look for a studio. Welcome, Yvonne. Please, sit down. What will you have? A piano. As soon as I catch the waiter's eye. Have you seen the morning paper? Are you one of those painters who is interested in all France? It's economics, it's politics. Well, not only all of France, but the whole world. Oh, I hope you are not going to talk a lot while you work. I need silence if I am to concentrate on who you wish me to be. Well, I paint very quietly. Good. Oh, waiter, two pianos here. So, you might consider working for me, Ivan? I might. I've heard of you. Well, that's fine. That's why I was looking in the newspaper to find a studio. At least as good as the one I had in London. Yvonne, tell me. When Pierre kept saying over and over, it's all her fault. What did he mean? I don't know. I had done a lot of posing for him. Uh, this one was a Corsican girl. Before that, we did a woman lady, and before that... Well, I shall speak very plainly. Artists don't generally make such a fuss about their models. Was there something in between you? Was Pierre in love with you? Well, all painters become in love with their models in a way. But then it passes. It's not a true love, you understand. They paint me as a Galatea. And they imagine themselves Pygmalion. Do you understand, Mr. Harlow? George. Uh, George. You are very well read, Yvonne. Uh, to be a model is not to be stupid. I'm not just a mannequin dressed or undressed, standing or sitting. I must think and feel who I am so you can paint me. My mother taught me that. Yes, I am well read, well educated, and I can speak well if I wish to. Uh, you're English, aren't you? Oh, yes, quite. Then I will tell you a little secret. The artists here in Paris think I'm French. Your first name is uh, George, isn't it? Yes, Yvonne. What did you just say? I said your name is George, isn't it? <laughs> Why, you're not French at all. Governor, I was born while Bell Bells was ringing. I'm an honest cock star, I am. Well, you do a French accent very well. And I'm not Yvonne, either. It's me professional name... But I'm not going to tell you, me baptismal. Yeah, Parisian or Londoner, Yvonne is perfectly all right with me. I've heard of you, George. I have friends in Cheapside. They've talked of you. You're a good man. Well, I'm selling well, if that's what you mean. Well, that was the trouble with Pierre. He wasn't selling. Well, that isn't the only thing troubling you. Well, I mean, we all have those dry spells. Look, since you've been honest enough with me, I'll do the same for you. Yvonne... Although you have the reputation in, in Paris of being an excellent model, there are certain painters who would avoid you. Oh, I suppose you mean that to lose low track. We didn't get on. And you know why? He's a very particular man. But I was long when it let he'd start throwing brushes at me and cursing. I don't like to be spoken to like that. And sometimes you wouldn't show up at all. Well, it's possible. On a very wet day... If it's too dark to paint, I'm saving the artist money by not arriving. Well, that could be one of the reasons Pierre was so angry. You think so? Yvonne, before we begin, I'll tell you this. If you make a promise for a session, rain or shine, I shall hold you to it. 
If you fail to appear, even if I have to start all over with another novel, I shall. I never made a promise I couldn't keep. Vaughn, if you wish to be my model, you begin by acknowledging the truth. I do, do I? Now, you know the truth as well as anyone. And if you don't keep your word and arrive at the time we agree, then the truth is I'm not the painter you'll be happy with. Now, I plan to start an important canvas, important to me. I'm calling it Aphrodite. Ah, oh, one of those goddesses who don't wear clothes. Can't you paint her in the summertime when it's warmer? My Aphrodite will wear a gown. And you will help me select one. A simple Roman or Grecian toga. If I can't find a studio I can keep heated in Paris, then I'll have to bring you to my studio in London. Now, there's good money in it for you. But I don't want to miss one working day. Not one. All right. I like you. You're a serious man. And I think you know I'm just as serious about my work. It's a partnership. A painter and his model. We both know that. You're right. I've always thought that. I suppose I have been a bit kind with these French painters. I'll be a model model. You'll see. Fine. I trust you will, Yvonne. That waiter never brought the drinks. You see, the French are just as casual. Oh, there you are, George. I've been looking everywhere for you. Max, Max, what will you have to drink? Please, sit down. No, I can't stay. Hello, Yvonne. Hello, Max. Tell me, how's your Adam and Eve canvas getting on? Yeah, I've had four Adams and five Eves, including Yvonne. The original creation was faster. <laughs> George... Have you heard about Pierre? No, I saw him yesterday. He's in a bad way, Max. At least he was. Oh. So you know. Well, I didn't want to spread it around. You must have heard since yours is the apartment just below. He was fooling around with a pistol yesterday. He almost hit him on. But I managed to calm him down. He did seem quieter when we left him. Oh, then you don't know. Pierre is dead. What? Did he shoot himself? No, not so far as I know. The landlady found him this morning lying on the floor. He'd crawled from his bed to a painting he was working on. No signs of anything. His heart just gave out. Pierre dead? So young. How very strange. <laughs> It's interesting to me that only the works of man are immortal. Shakespeare and Ben Johnson have long turned to dust, but their words are as alive today as when first spoken. The same is true of the great composers, sculptors, architects, painters. Their lives live on in their works. And the model, Yvonne, will be the only memorial to those last months of Pierre Maurice, perhaps also of George Haller, when the memory of those artists as people have completely faded, I shall be back shortly with Act Two. Paris in the 1800s, the left bank, Café of the Deux Mégaux. Rendezvous of practically every musician, painter, actor, and author for over a century. And now this meeting. Word that Pierre Maurice, the painter, who the day before had attempted to shoot his model, was this morning found dead. Max, you're quite sure he didn't shoot himself? Quite sure, George. There wasn't a gun in the place. Don't you remember, George, when we left, you took his pistol with you? Yes, I did. Oh, this is very sad news, Max. I mean, Pierre had genius. What he didn't have was patience. You have any idea how he died? You know I live on the fourth floor below him. Very early this morning, Gabrielle, our landlady, came knocking on my door. Would I accompany her upstairs to Pierre's? She sensed something was wrong. There he lay on the floor, dead. No gun, nothing. The only weapon, you might say, is he had a pallet knife in one hand, but that has no cutting edge. There were bedclothes on the floor. He had crawled to a painting he'd been working on. He'd already started to cut the canvas, slicing it straight through from top to bottom. Was it the head of a woman 
Wearing a blue shawl? Yes, it was Ivana. In one of the earliest versions, he did of me as the Corsican flower girl. We left Paris, Ivana and I. I was quite pleased getting a very modeled post for me who had been a favorite of countless impressionists and some of the best-known French painters of the day. Somehow, for some inexplicable reason from the very beginning, I was not working well on my Aphrodite. All right, Yvonne. I think you deserve a rest. Oh, no, no, George. Come on. I can hold this pose another hour. But the light will still be good until five. Frankly, it's more for my sake than for yours. Maybe we'll pick up later. We'll see. I'll just shout downstairs to Mrs. Harris and ask for a pot of tea for us. All right? Yes. Tea will be fine. Mrs. Harris, would you bring us up a pot of tea, please? Thank you. She never answers you. Have you noticed? Never has in 15 years. It means she's heard. Doesn't want to waste her breath. In all these months, you know, I've never met her. Well, she's very discreet when it comes to painters. Before I took over this studio, others occupied this space. Romney was supposed to have worked here. She's a wise old bird and rather proud of her boys, as she calls us painters. Now, I tried to catch her, you know, just to see her. She knocks and leaves the teapot and cups outside. I run to the door, but I always miss her. Whatever is this interest in my landlady? I'd like her to know that this Aphrodite has got clothes on. Uh, that's the tea. Stay where you are, Aphrodite. I'll get it. And while we're taking our break, I think we ought to talk a little more about this goddess you're enacting. You know something, George? You're the first painter I ever posed for who treated me like a human being. Perhaps that's my mistake. I want you to be a goddess. What I want to do is more than just a physical representation of a beautiful woman. I don't understand. Now... I'm going to give you a book about Aphrodite. I know next week you're planning a vacation with some friends in Blackpool, and I want you to read the whole book. Of course I will. I wish I knew what I'm not doing to help you, George. I know Aphrodite was a goddess long before Homer wrote about her. You know, there are those who will tell you that love and death are two sides of the same coin. That love is the justification for man, and death the final passion. Do you understand? Yes. You're finding that what I am thinking and saying with my face and body while I'm posing is not love. That's the way it strikes me. So, do read the book. I hope it will bring you closer to Aphrodite. I want people to look at you and go away knowing there is real love. That an Aphrodite can inspire everyone. You know, George, you really have a way with words you have. Yvonne went off to Blackpool, and I was suddenly and unaccountably overcome with a feeling of loneliness. In fact, dreading to be alone. The days passed all too slowly. I could hardly wait for her return. Then, as if heaven had divined my problem, Max knocked and stood outside my door, suitcase in hand. <laughs> what a welcome, George. I I had no idea you'd be that pleased to see me. How long are you staying, you old ruffian? Oh, a week or so. Why, you want to be real with me already? Oh, stay as long as you wish. Now, tell me everything. What's the latest news in Paris? Well, I finally sold that monstrous Adam and Eve I've been fussing with since Christmas. Good. Congratulations. The private collector made quite a bundle on it. Enough so I could indulge in a bit and come over here to visit you. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, um, by the way, they're having a retrospective of Pierre's work at the Academy next February. Oh, to commemorate his death? How can you say that? No, to honor a great artist who died before his time. Hmm. Max, did they ever find out what the cause was? Oh, a simple stoppage of the heart. It stopped. What else could it have been? Heart failure at 35? I mean, he had no history of any trouble. At least if he did, no one knew. Who, uh, who took care of his effects? No, I did. 
I gave all his works to the academy, sold what furniture I could to pay the back rent, and I have brought you a bundle of his brushes. I know he would have liked you to have them. Pierre's brushes? That was thoughtful of you, Max. And that's not all. He'd done a small head of Yvonne, another practice sketch for the Corsican flower girl. I thought, since she's your model now, perhaps you'd like to have it. Huh. Beautiful work, isn't it? As soon as I saw it, I wrapped it up for you. There's something written on the back. Oh, is there? Oh, so there is. Uh, what do you make of it? The devil is a, is a woman. The devil is... What's that last word? Mm. It's so scrawled. Ah, uh, I think it's you. Why? Oh, you. The devil is you. Hey, it's yours, George. I should treasure it. Uh, by the way, how's the girl working out? I suppose it's difficult for her, a French girl living in London, although her English is very good. I'll let you in on a secret, and don't you dare to tell her that I told you. Yvonne isn't French at all. What, really? Not French? No, you should hear her now. Just the same, English or French, she's an excellent, hard-working model. Right now she's on holiday with friends. I expect her back any day now. You're <laughs> rather a very patient man. Oh, you haven't had the trouble with her. Most artists in the Cartier have had. Well, she's been extremely reliable with me, Max. I can still hear old Pierre screaming through the walls because she didn't bother to show up. Well, I guess she's reformed. Because she's punctual and she's cooperative. There is something wrong, however. But it's not Yvonne. It's me. What is it that's wrong? I can't even decide on the pose that I want her to adopt. Well, it's Aphrodite, no? Well, I'm not, I'm not doing her disrobed. As a matter of fact, if you examine the Greek temples, she's always wearing some diaphanous gown. So I, I, I need a feeling, a feeling of motion, of, of a breeze stirring. Well, I tried her standing, her hand on a stuffed wolfhound. And suddenly I realized I wasn't painting Aphrodite at all, but Diana the Huntress. And there are other problems. For some reason, she just isn't thinking properly. George... Are you sure you're going about this the right way? I don't follow you. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me unpack and let's go and eat. And then I'll have a look at what you've been up to. You know, you may have already painted Aphrodite and you don't even know it. Do you realize, George, I've been here three days already? No, it hasn't been that long. Three minutes. I like it. I've been studying all your trial sketches and drawings for Aphrodite. And there's one quality of that girl you've managed to preserve, and I'll tell you this. It gives me a peculiar feeling along my spine. If Aphrodite is to be a symbol of love... I don't know that you've captured it. So you've recognized it. Her eyes. Exactly. Yvonne's eyes. There's animal in it, or in them. Some creature they remind me of. Not the eyes of a human being, it's true. Somehow her expression is always animalistic. Wasn't Aphrodite the goddess of desire? Yes. And in legends led many a man to his death. But that's not the effect that I want to paint. That's not the Aphrodite I want. Mm, for all you know, perhaps Yvonne is closer to the legendary Aphrodite, the seductress. Well, I've given her a book to read, and I'm hoping when she returns it will have intellectually stimulated her. Yes, but will it change her eyes? I'm hopeful. <laughs> you do demand a great deal of your models, George. I very much doubt whether you're going to affect a change through her mind. And she has a nice face and a good figure. The rest is up to you. You've got to put the soul into the painting. She can't do it for you. <laughs> Why am I telling you all this? You know better than I do. I've been thinking this more as a joint undertaking between the model and myself. Rather than just using her as a stuffed, life-sized doll. 
I'll show you what I mean. Let's take everything and line them up against the wall. You see, Max, what I'm mm-hmm. aiming at is not a siren or a seductress, not a passionate creature who causes men to lose their heads, but the symbol of true love. This has a lovely glint. Sparkle. And that, George? <laughs> Hello, Max. George, I think I know what you want. I read the book. Welcome back, Yvonne. Nice to see you again. Paris misses you. I'm going to confess something. I was standing outside wondering if I should open the door and walk in or knock. And I heard what you were saying. We said nothing that wasn't complimentary. Uh, George, I just know if I can express the pure love you are asking from me in my pose. And my life hasn't been easy. And I suppose whatever innocence you want won't come through. George is wrong to want it. I think you have the ideal Aphrodite in Yvonne, but you seem to refuse to paint it. It's a strange relationship between model and artist. Strange only in that it represents a kind of half-love. And, as in the case of the painter Pierre Maurice, who died in the act of destroying a painting he once loved, in his life, there was not only half love, but half death. I shall find it difficult to wait for the answers and the conclusion, which will be revealed shortly with Act Three. Days have passed, then weeks. Max has returned to Paris. A strange new relationship develops between George and Yvonne. In fact, it is somewhat less than a relationship. Few words pass between them. The model poses. The artist paints. The clock ticks. Tea is brought up. The silences are longer than the speeches. We'll take a break. I'm not tired. Look, there's still light. I said we'll take a break. Now, if you care to, you can remain here. I'll go for a walk. May I see how the painting is going? No, you may not see. I'm turning it to the wall. And if you remain in the studio, I'm putting you on your honor not to look. Oh, George, what is it? What's happening? We were good friends. And Max came, and since he left, you haven't been the same. Max was right. I was wrong. But I can't do it. For a painting to do so much damage to what was a nice feeling. After all, it's just another painting. It is not just another painting. Well, perhaps you should get another model. I'm doing something wrong, and I know it. I'm not helping. But I feel badly about taking your money for posing, and you're not satisfied. Yvonne, it's not you. It's me. We'll talk about it when I get back. And how long will that be? Who knows? Yes, Mrs. Harris. Thank you for the tea. It's not Mrs. Harris. (laughs) Decidedly not. Mrs. Harris... And I haven't brought any tea. Oh, Max. Max, I'm so glad to see you. Another visit to London wouldn't be complete if I didn't visit George in the most beautiful cockney of Paris. Oh, he told you. I hope you don't mind. Oh, where is Michelangelo? He went out for a walk. He should be back soon. How's it going? Oh, it couldn't be worse. Looking for George, I... I don't know what he wants. It's painful. It's sad. And I confess to you, when I wake up in the morning and the skies are gray and I know he won't work, that's when I feel happiest. That's when I bless English weather. He's still not fussy with Aphrodite, is he? Uh, Let me see what he's done. Don't go near it, Max. They'll think I put you up to it. Yes, it's still Aphrodite. But he's forbidden me to look at it. That's why the easel is turned to the wall. Mm, I wish I knew what to tell you. He doesn't sound like the George Heller I used to know. He's not, Max. I'm beginning to hate every day I have to come here. He hasn't said anything pleasant to me in weeks. Well, I shall just sit here and wait for his lordship to return. You're sweet. And maybe I'd better move off to my room in Fulham Road. No, no, no. You stay. Perhaps my being here will put George in a better frame of mind. Oh, I hope so. What is going on in this studio, believe me, is destroying us both. Oh, here you are. 
The return of the prodigal painter, Max. You always turn up in the nick of time. When my paintings are selling so well, I can not only afford London, but after my stay here, then Italy and Greece. Oh, you're so lucky, Max. It's hard work, not luck. Yvonne is right, George. It's luck. Suddenly, my daubs are in vogue. A year from now, they'll be saying, Max Kaminsky, who's he? Did he die? You know, that might be the answer. What, to kill me? What are you saying, my dear? No, I don't mean that. I mean Greece. George, why don't you finish Aphrodite there? I mean, she was a Greek goddess. The child may have something. I'd take you both to the trip. The more I think about it, the better I like it. Well, I don't like it at all. Yvonne, that's all for today. You may go tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock sharp. Max, it's been lovely seeing you. I hope before you go we'll have a chance to talk. Tomorrow morning at 8. I'll get the door for you. I can't tell you, Max, how happy just seeing you makes me. Me too, child. Do you mind if I kiss you goodnight? <laughs> I should be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> Hope to see you again, Max. Good night, George. Good night. Max, I'm having a devil of a time, and I hope you won't mind my bending your ear with my problems. What's happened between you and your famous model? Happened? Nothing's happened. The work never went better. Oh, perhaps there was too much relationship. I wanted her to become the Aphrodite that I envisaged. And I learned that was impossible. So I use the face, the features, the figure, and I paint what's in my mind. Well, the impression I get from you is that Yvonne is not helping. Max, would you believe it if I told you what I have painted one day is no longer there the next? I would tell you to take a rest. Am I demented? What is this feeling that she casts an evil eye over me? I disregard that. How much longer do you actually need her? Well, I would say just one more sitting should do it. Just a few more touches. The rest I can do on my own without anyone. I mean, this is the crucial time, Max. Perhaps that's why I'm so... So, so, so hostile to Yvonne? Am I? And you don't even know it? Yes, yes, I do. It's because I'm really afraid of her. Terrified that I'll never complete the painting. Max, remember the day we went through all the sketches? Let me show you something. A few weeks ago, I did this one. It was intended to evoke all goddesses. Or at least Atalanta. You remember the one who raced for the golden apple? Yes. Well done. Well done. That missed that feeling of long ago and far away. Well, this painting was on the easel. When I looked at it the next day, instead of racing with the golden apple, even had taken one of the apples and was eating it. Yvonne, I hadn't painted it that way, but the next day, that's the way it looked to me. Well, what did you do? I hadn't touched it. I left it with a goddess having the apple on her hand, and the next time I saw it, she was eating it. Well, she's not eating it now. Uh, I, I think you're blaming Yvonne for what's going on inside your own head. Max, I want you to have a long look at Aphrodite. Now get it over here under the skylight so you can see her better. Mm -hmm. My Lord, but she's lovely. Yes, she is, isn't she? Oh, you've been going through. And still you've done it. She's like no other woman I've ever seen on canvas. You see what I mean about a little more work to be done, Max? The eyes. I want a deeper shadow there. I mean, one morning's work should do it. If she comes. Doesn't she always? Yes, yes, she does. But perhaps this time... Who knows? I have not treated her well, I know that. But fear is a strange thing. Now, come... There's an all-night cafe on the corner, if I remember. They serve a good breakfast, but I'd like to take you for a drink before then. I had a feeling that I had trampled too hard on Yvonne, and that she wouldn't show up at 8 or even 8.30, perhaps not at all. 
So I went out for coffee to that little place Max and I had shared a nightcap the night before. I didn't hurt her. I kept reining in my emotions. Had she forgiven me? Would she come? I got back to the studio, reached for my key, and the door was open. Good morning, George. Well, I am surprised. Should you be here? You said eight. Yes, I did. You've been here since eight? Yes. The wonders never cease. And all in costume, right up there on the throne. Yes, yes, that's right. The angle of your face is just fine. You know, I was just... I was just thinking. No. No, my original impression was right. The eyes to glisten a bit more. Do you know, Yvonne, your eyes this morning are absolutely glowing. You must have had a fine sleep. Glowing. Can you hold it, Yvonne? Good. Good. I guess we'll both be glad when it's over. And it ought to be over very soon. I want to tell you something very strange, Yvonne. Painting you as I am now. Concentrating on every brush stroke, every line, every highlight. It's as if you and the very light itself are anticipating my every move. Oh, that is beautiful. Beautiful. I've never seen such a look in your eyes, Yvonne. Unearthly, really. Quite unearthly. The look of a goddess. I once read when they asked the young Mozart how he was able to write such divine music, he said, the Lord held my pen. That's the way I feel now, Ivan. You are the will that my hands must obey. Now, one more touch with the single brush that I have. I have here somewhere. And then we can both stand back to worship your Aphrodite. Yvonne? Yvonne, where are you? Yvonne, where did you go? Max, I think you're here. You didn't happen to see Yvonne going down the stairs as you came up, did you? Yvonne? George, what are you telling me? She was sitting on the throne, the silver one. I can't even remember what she said. I was painting steadily, the eyes, remember? Then I went into the other room. I had remembered that you had given me some of Pierre's brushes. And he had a sable brush that I wanted to try. I walked back in here, and she was gone. A minute later, you walk in the door. Now, where did she go? Are you saying that Yvonne, our Yvonne, was just here now, posing? She was here since eight. Look at the eyes. It's still wet. I didn't even have a chance to thank her, let alone pay her. George, I want you to sit down. What for? I'm going to read you something from the morning newspaper. Ah, yes, here we are. Motor fatalities. A young woman, a professional model by the name of Yvonne was knocked down by a car in the Fulham Road about 7 o'clock last night. What? The owner of the car stopped and took the lady to the Fulham Hospital, where she expired within a few minutes of her admission to the hospital. Well, that's unbelievable, Max. My Lord, I was just painting her just now right here. And she was dead. What do you mean you were painting her? Yvonne, look at her. Aphrodite, look at the painting. Two hours' work done this morning. I, I, I completed it moments before you arrived. Max, she was here, I tell you. It was a sublime experience. A model who, through thought, wills a painter to paint. I painted like a man possessed. And yet, it's not possible. You tell me she died last night? Yvonne had but one aim in her life. In fact, but one reason for living. And so this morning, she returned to your studio so that you could put the final touches on Aphrodite. It's like much of what's been happening to you since the girl started modeling for you. Unexplainable. 
inexplicable. Yet you chose the right subject for her to portray, didn't you? Aphrodite, the goddess of love. I shall miss her so. But only you and I will know that she was actually the goddess of death. For the record, the painting of Aphrodite by George Hallow has been exhibited in nearly every major art museum in the world. It was his masterpiece, and as a matter of fact, his last painting. He gave up painting after Aphrodite, taught and lectured for a while. He would answer questions from the audience, but there was one he always avoided answering, and that was, who is your model for the goddess of love? I shall return shortly. Edna? Hey. Do you have the key? Oh. oh. Oh, never mind. We forgot to lock the door. I'll hang up the coats, Melvin. Good girl. Oh. Melvin. Mm-hmm? Take a look in the closet. Edna. Yes, Melvin? There is a dog in the closet. Hiya. Hiya. Hi. Don't worry. It's me, McGruff, the Hi. crime dog. Oh, he talks. Of course. How else could I tell you not to leave your door unlocked? Oh, you're McGruff, the crime dog. Edna, you're talking to a dog. I'll uh, say it again. Lock your windows and doors. Use a timer to turn lights on and off. Oh. And uh, tell your neighbors to keep an eye on your house. Good idea. Uh, by the way, you got a neighborhood watch program? Uh, neighborhood watch? <laughs> What's that? Uh, that's where you and your neighbors learn how to protect each other and your neighborhood. Oh. But uh, find out more. Write to McGruff. Box 6600 Rockville, Maryland, and help the... Uh, take a bite out of crime. Edna, lock the door. Gotcha. A message from the Crime Prevention Coalition and the Ad Council. Fascinating tale of mystery, that. And to close, a few words from the writer poet Ben Johnson. Give me a look, give me a face that makes simplicity a grace. Robes loosely flowing, hair is free, such sweet neglect more taketh me than all the adulteries of art. They strike mine eyes. But not my heart. Our cast included Diana Kirkwood, Mandel Kramer, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Kenneth Davis, who headed my shipping department, was a narrow, bigoted, mean-spirited, petty tyrant. <laughs> Well, you know how it is. Only speak well of the dead. How does it go? Uh, de mortuis nihil nisi bonum. Oh, your Latin is excellent. Your respect for the truth leaves something to be desired. Now, tell me, why are you so concerned? Well, you identified Kenneth T. Davis as an employee of Cheswick Kaufman. That isn't true. He was not. But his wife told me I had fired him. Oh. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm Tammy Grimes. The Greek god of love was called Eros. Eros was the first of the Greek gods, born from the cosmic egg, a physical and elemental force, a divinity of fertility. Now, millenniums later, love is still the prime principle of life. We celebrate and exalt it, as though our very lives depended on it. And in truth, they do. And not only our lives, but the lives of all our descendants forever. Is it a deal? It's a deal. You like the idea? It's all right. You want the job? I've got nothing better to do. You approve of the plan? Sounds okay. 
Oh, really? I wish you could summon up a little enthusiasm. Lady, I lost my enthusiasm for anything a long time ago. If I ever had any. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Last Plan, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric, who also stars as a woman. I'll be back shortly with that one. We spoke at the opening of the Greek god Eros. Now we must tell you something of Thanatos. Thanatos, brother of sleep and the night, dweller in the lower world, and the personification of death. What, you may be asking, have these two, Eros and Thanatos, to do with each other? And what place do they have in a simple radio drama? Listen, and we'll try to tell you. I seem to have this cat. She wandered in one day and simply stayed. I can't tell if she's happy here or not. I don't know whether she likes me or hates me. I think to her I'm an adequate housekeeper. Not the best, not the worst, just adequate. She may move on any day now. That's what she seems to be thinking. As soon as she's figured it out. Meanwhile, hold the phone. Well, it breaks the monotony. Yes? Hello? Hello? Is that you? Of course. Well, this is me. Can I come over? Why? Listen, it's happened again. Oh, no, not again. Yes, and it's worse than ever. Well, what do you want with me? I have to talk to somebody. It's getting serious. Well, what do you think I can do? Figure out a way to stop it. And it's been going on for years, years. I told you, it's getting worse. It's driving me crazy. You ask me, you're both crazy. He's crazy. That's who's crazy. Look, can I even talk to you about it? I don't like to get involved in something like this. Oh, that's what everybody says. I don't want to get involved. Well, somebody's got to get involved because things can't go on this way. Why well, can't they? You've made out all right so far. I told you, it's getting worse. Something awful is going to happen. Please, I need to talk it over. Please. All right. Is it okay to come over now? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Whatever else you may say about the young, they're bored. And these two have been boring me for years. Everything to them is so important. Whereas to me, almost nothing is. Except perhaps that errant cat. When she fixes that long, unwavering gaze on me. What's behind those yellow eyes with the thin black slits down their center? I wonder, is it approval or contempt? Is it hatred or is it... Oh, no. <laughs> no, it couldn't be love. Could it? Oh, no, not even affection and certainly not love. Oh, she's here with her interminable doubts, fears, and complaints. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Give me your coat and go sit down. I really do appreciate this. Well, so far, there's nothing to appreciate. Well, just seeing Go me. sit down. Oh, I didn't know you had a cat. No, I don't. The cat has me. What's her name? I haven't given her one. I'm waiting to see what name she's given me. And the knows what that'll be. Oh, you're weird. You know it? You know it? Yes, I suppose I am. I think I've been weird for a long time. Sit down. That's probably why I like you. Because I'm weird? It's a strange reason to like someone. Oh, I know. But I feel you know things. Well, I don't. I hardly know anything. For certain, that is. But that's what I mean. If that last remark signifies anything, it escapes me. Oh, me too. What 
Well, at least I'm glad to see you've recovered somewhat from your recent hysteria over the telephone. Oh, yes. That. Perhaps now you can tell me calmly and quietly the reason for it. He tried to strangle me. Oh, really? When was this? At breakfast. Any special reason? He thought I put poison in his coffee. Oh? And did you? Oh, certainly not. Would I do a thing like that? I don't know. Would you? I love him. Uh-huh. I think he's the most wonderful man in the world. Very difficult living with the most wonderful man in the world. Quite a strain. Well, don't you think he's wonderful? I hardly ever think about him at all. You'd better start thinking about him now. Because one of these days, he's going to kill me. If you don't stop him. Me? Stop him? How can I stop him? Oh, well, you'll think of something. Your confidence is touching. You don't want me to die, do you? No. No, I don't want you to die. Not actively, that is. Well, then... But do I want you to live? That's the question, isn't it? Do I actively, positively want you to live? I'll have to think about that. But I'm young, I'm attractive, successful... I have a whole life ahead of me. All true, all true. But so many innocent victims have been young and attractive and successful, haven't they? Nevertheless, they died. Well, don't let it happen to me. Why don't you leave him? When I love him? Oh, I forgot. Where would I go? Any place. You're rich enough. And let him take over? He would, you know, the day after I left town. No, he's just waiting for me to do something like that. Looks like a hopeless situation. It can't be. You have to think of something. You have to. Well, I'll try. Oh, good. I said I'll try. I can't promise anything. Oh, if you really try, you'll think of something. I know you will. Uh, I have to go now. Just keep on thinking. Keep trying. Remember, I'm counting on you to save my life. <laughs> But boring. Boring in the extreme. Why do young people think there's a solution for everything? Must be, has to be. Don't they know? No, they don't know. They don't know anything. Because they're young. What's that, a visitor again? Why don't people call first? Ask permission. Who will? Hello. All right to come in? What do you want? Well, is it okay to come in? You let her come in. Why not me? She told you she was here? Yeah. So is it all right to come in? You let her, so why not me? Did she tell you why she was here? She didn't have to tell me. It was the same old thing. I know that. Well, wasn't it? Ah, never mind. I know it was. She said you tried to choke her to death at breakfast. Ah, it's all in her head. I wouldn't have done it. I just got mad and... Well, first thing I knew, but I, I wouldn't have done it, not not actually done it. I love her. I mean, she's the greatest, the best. I mean, she's super. Look, is, is it all right if I come in for a minute? Come in for a minute. No more. Good. Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, hey, you got a cat. <laughs> she friendly? I don't know. I haven't had time to find out. Sit down if you want to. Hey, she's got funny eyes, hasn't she? Who has? The cat. Hey, look, it looks like she's sizing you up. Sizing me up? Yeah, you, me, everybody, the whole world, the whole setup. Are you going to use your minute talking about a cat? No, no. Or the world situation? No, the situation between her and me. Something's got to be done about it. That's what she said. Well, she's right. I mean, something's got to be done. We can't go on this way. It's, it's, it's just impossible. You can see that, can't you? I'm not sure I can. Well, you see, she's she's got this idea that, that I'm out to get her. And you're not? No, of course I'm not. Mm, go on. Well, so she's, she's trying to defend herself against me. And how does she figure on doing that? By getting me first. Can't you see that? Maybe I'm stupid. Tell me more. Well, that's why she started putting this stuff in my coffee. What sort of stuff? Who knows? I don't know. Maybe maybe I should try and then find out. Then I could I could find the antidote, keep it handy. Sounds reasonable. Probably one of those things that works slowly, takes a long time. She probably started out with just a little, and then then she kept adding more and more until finally I could taste it. 
Yeah, I waited till I was perfectly sure that was what she was doing, and finally, there was no doubt about it. Absolutely no doubt at all. Well, then I saw red. I mean, a man can't just sit there like a lump and let himself be poisoned to death, right? Um, yes, right. Right, so that's when I went for a throat. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to, didn't I? If you were sure. I had to let her know I knew. Knew what? What she was up to. What's the matter with you? I mean, I just explained the whole thing to you, didn't I? Holy... No, 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 no. Calm down. Tell me what you want me to do. I, wa I want you to think of something, some way to stop it, because we can't go on like this. No, I can see you can't. Has it ever occurred to you that perhaps you're both irrational, even insane? <laughs> We're as sane as you are. Is that saying so much? Oh, now, listen. We've always depended on you. You're so much older. Gee, thanks. Well, I mean, you're wiser. You're more educated. You, you've read a lot. You've been places. You've seen things. You've done things. If anybody can figure this out, you can. All I can say is I'll try. Now, go on home, and I'll see what I can come up with. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll be in touch. <coughs> It's late. Even the cat is asleep, worn out with watching me. Or perhaps simply bored. Who knows about cats? Not I. It's laughable, really. I can't even understand a common cat. How am I to keep two ridiculous children from mutual murder? Why did I ever say I'd make the attempt? It's not too late to back out. No. Wait. Wait, hold on a minute. It's a possibility. Just a possibility. If he'd do it, if he could. Oh, but of course he could. He can do anything. And I know he'd do it for me. Hello? I didn't wake you, did I? No. If I did, I'm sorry. You didn't? I'd like to see you. What about? I may have a job for you. Oh? You free tomorrow? What time? Any time. I'll be here all day. I'll be over in the morning. You won't be sorry you made the trip. See you then. The cat's awake. Her yellow eyes are fixed on me with that calculating look. Did she listen to my whole conversation? Did she approve or disapprove? What do I care? She's only a cat. But I care. I care a lot. that presents itself? How eros cohabits with Thanatos and the result is conflict? How life exists side by side in the same house with death? In the act to follow, we shall attempt to explore further this dichotomy in the story called The Last Plan. <laughs> Yet each man kills the thing he loves. By each let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look. Some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss. The brave man with a sword. These despairing lines were composed in 1898 by Oscar Wilde. But let us remember that he wrote them from Reading Jail where he'd been confined under the most humiliating and degrading circumstances. The cat has been staring at me all morning, and I have been staring back. It's true that humans can eventually make an animal shift its gaze. By an effort of will, I could make this cat look away. But I cannot avoid the feeling that she is simply disgusted by what she sees or made uncomfortable by what she considers to be atrocious manners on my part. Ah, 
There he is at last. I don't like him to make me wait. Well, it's about time. I said this morning. It's almost noon. It's still morning. Well, if you want to be petty about it. Merely precise. Don't sit there. You'll squash the cat. Oh, sorry. I didn't know you got a cat. She took up residence here one day for no good reason. Get rid of her if you don't like her. I can't decide. Sit over there. Can I get you something to drink? I don't drink. You know that. No, I forgot. So... What's the proposition? I haven't got all day. Oh, I hoped you would have. Don't try that kittenish stuff on me. I don't go for it. What's the proposition? Lay it out for me. Well, it concerns two young friends of mine. Acquaintances, really. Friendship connotes some sort of equality, don't you think? Some community of interest. Both of which are impossible between them and me because of their youth. In your age? Well, my maturity, I'd prefer to call it that. So what's the project? What have you got in mind? Where do I fit in? Well, both of them came to see me yesterday, begging for help. It seems they're trying to kill each other. So? Yesterday, so he says, he tried to poison him. Put something in his morning coffee. Actually, according to his version of it, she'd been poisoning his coffee for some time. But after a while, he began to taste it, and yesterday he became positive that was what she was trying to do. So? So he went for her throat, trying to choke her to death, she says. I take it he didn't succeed, or she wouldn't have called you? No, but he frightened her badly, which, according to him, is what he was trying to do. You see, he's convinced she plans to kill him in self-defense. Because she believes he means to kill her. So, to protect himself, he has to let her know that if she tries to kill him, he will kill her. Purely a matter of self-defense, so he says. Sounds like they weren't getting along. Yes, it does sound that way, doesn't it? On the other hand, each claims to be devoted to the other. Mm -hmm. So, they both come to me asking me to devise a way to keep them from this... this reciprocal assassination... I said I'd think about it and see if I could come up with something. Well, did you? I racked my brains and I couldn't think of a thing. It's not as though I was really interested in them and their foolish problem. They're young, self-absorbed, self-righteous, self-important. Who are they? Well, I don't think I should tell you that until you hear the plan I finally devised. After you've heard it, if you consent to it, then I'll give you their names and all pertinent information. You can ask anything you like. One thing I would like to ask up front. Have they got money? Money? Heavens, yes. They may not have brains or sensitivity or common sense, but money they have. Untold quantities of money. Enough to afford me? They could afford 20 of you. Are they fighting about money? Well, I'm not sure. That may be it. How to manage it, perhaps. So why that should be a bone of contention, I'm sure I don't know. They have so much of it. So what's the big plan you've come up with? And how do I fit into it? All right, I'll tell you. It'll necessitate your watching them every minute of the day and night. I can do that. As soon as either one of them makes an aggressive move, you'll kill them both. Uh-huh. What am I supposed to take as an aggressive move? Well, that'll have to be agreed upon in advance. But who makes the decision? What I'm getting at. Who gives me my orders? They've got to come from somewhere, don't they? Well, I think they should come from me. I suppose. It's your plan. I'm just the executioner. Are you trying to be funny? Me? I was never funny. You know that. I do know. So go on about your plan. So far, all you've told me is... If you think one of them means business, you tell me. And I waste the both of them. Is that it? That's the idea. But that's not what I believe will happen. Actually, that would be most unfortunate. It wasn't my thought that they should actually die. No? What then? Well, the heart of the plan is, if both think that a hostile move on either part would mean the end of both of them, well, that should restrain them, shouldn't it? If he kills her, you kill him. If she kills him, you kill her. Both know this in advance, so where's the problem? I got a hand it to you. You got brains. Oh, I thought you'd never know. The only thing is there's two of them, you said. How do I stay in the tail of two people? 
I take it they're not always side by side. Well, that doesn't matter. As long as they know you're watching one of them, they don't have to know which one, do they? As long as they know that one false step on the part of either means curtains for both of them. I guess you're right. Yeah, you must be right. Probably you won't have to kill anybody at all. Oh, I don't mind. No, I never thought you would. How do I get in touch with you if I think one of them is getting out of line? No, come here and tell me. If there's time, or phone if there isn't. Okay. Now about the money. I come high, you know. Very high. Don't worry, my darling. The price will be higher than any you've ever dreamed of. Oh, you'll excuse me, the phone? Go ahead. Think over everything I've said. Oh, I will, I will. Hello? Hello. Hello, it's me. Are you alone? Well, not exactly, no. Oh, oh, sorry. Maybe I should call back later. Is it important? Well, to me it is. Not another disagreement. No, no, not so far, but I'm expecting one. I, I feel it coming on. Uh, look, uh, I'll call you back. No, no, hold on. We can talk for a minute or so. You sound nervous. Yeah, I am. You can't tell me why, if you know. Oh, I know, all right. This time I know for sure. I saw it. You saw what? The knife. The knife? What knife? Her knife. She went out and bought a knife. She carries it around with her. I saw it. It's got a blade. Six inches long. And it's sharp. Skinny and sharp. Well, she hasn't tried to use it, has she? No, but she's getting ready to. She's just waiting for the right moment, and then she'll go for me. Look, um, there's someone here right now. Oh. Who is it? And Well, no one you know. And if we're lucky, you won't ever have to know. But we are discussing an idea I had, a way to keep you two from killing each other. An idea? You, you said you, you have an idea? We're just in the process of working it out. Well, what is it? What's the idea? Call me back later and I'll tell you once it's finalized. Okay. Now, you'll be sure and be there, won't you? Oh, I'll be here. Because I'm getting plenty scared. Well, try to control yourself and leave everything up to me. You'll come through for us. I know you will. I'm trying. I don't want to die. Call me back in a few minutes. Right. Will do. Well, I suppose you could figure out who that was. One half of the charming couple. The boy. It seems the girl has purchased a knife, a skinny one. Very sharp with a blade six inches long. Women go for knives. I've noticed that. Yes, I wonder why. Search me. Well, what do you think of my scheme? It's okay. Foolproof, wouldn't you say? As much as anything ever is. And you'll take care of the... The physical end of it? If the money's right. It will be. So, is it a deal? It's a deal. You really like the idea? It's all right. You'll take the job? I got nothing better to do. You approve of the plan? Sounds okay. Oh, really? I wish you could summon up a little enthusiasm. Lady, I lost my enthusiasm for anything a long time ago. If I ever had it. Oh, he must be calling back. Well, I'll have good news for him. Hello? Hi, it's me. Oh. Oh, it's you. You sound surprised. Well, I am a little. I, uh, I was expecting someone else to call. Who? Oh, never mind. Him? Well, yes, as a matter of fact. I might have known. Is it true you went out and bought a knife? What if I did? A sharp one? With a six-inch blade. So what? It's not as though I'm going to use it. Then what did you buy it for? To have it. In case. In case what? In case he gets any funny ideas. I see. Did he tell you I bought a knife? Well, as a matter of fact, he did on the phone a few minutes ago. Oh, I might have known he would. Why shouldn't he? No reason. Boy, he couldn't wait, could he? Dirty little coward. Wait for what? To defend himself against me. What's he done? That's what I called up to tell you. He's got a gun. Oh, has he? He carries it around with him all the time, stuck in his belt. One of these days. You mark my words, one of these days. Look, I've got someone here right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll hang up. No, no, that's all right. It's just that my, uh, my friend and I were working out a little plan that might just solve the whole problem. Really? You can mean it? Well... With my brains and his muscle. Call me back. Oh, oh I will, I will. Uh, how soon? In five minutes to do it. Okay, bye. The other half? Yes. Just as hysterical as he was. 
He wanted to tell me he's bought a gun. Carries it around with him stuck in his belt. Sounds like they both mean business. Oh, but they don't. No, they don't. They don't really. They're just squared off against each other, hostile and suspicious, each waiting for the other to make a move. You could be right. If they both know... Don't you see... If they both know that a wrong move will mean the end for both of them... You already told me. I got to be on my way. You really have to go. I really do. I thought maybe you and I... Nope. Not you and I. Not maybe. Not possibly. Why not? Tell me why not. Because, lady, you scare me. And I don't scare easy, as you very well know. I don't mean to. Must be a talent you have. Something you were born with. So long. See you tomorrow. Am I always to be left alone like this? Even by a common, ordinary killer like him? We could have stayed for an hour. We could have talked. I'm left with nothing but a cat. A cat who looks at me with contempt. Could it be that behind that icy stare lies a small trace of pity? I settled for that. Just a little bit of compassion. I sunk so low I'd settle for that. I need it. Even from a cat. In our history, there was a compact organization called Murder Incorporated. At least, uh, so they were named by the media. I'm not sure what its members called themselves. But their sole, cold function was to kill. When told, and paid to do so. Can it be that the gentleman who has just left the lady so precipitously is a resurrection of that specialized group? A one-man murder incorporated. We'll return shortly with the final act. The lady who had devised the last plan in a desperate effort to deliver two young people from the threat and the fear of sudden death is a lonely lady, one given to morbid musings on the ways of power and its uses. Out of her isolation and her melancholy, she has evolved a bizarre solution we have elected to call the last plan. It was six weeks ago that I brought the young people together with the man and the plan was laid. Was I right? Will it work? The cat is sleeping, her long body stretched out to its full length, one paw flung across her eyes. And the blue hour is coming on, that last gasp of light before the dark, the lingering of the day that whispers of the night. Alone with the indifferent cat, I think back upon what has happened since the meeting between the man and the young couple and the hatching of the plan. Aren't they supposed to be here by now? Any minute now. Why do I have to meet them anyway? Just this once, I think you should see them face to face. I don't want you to back out and spoil everything. I'm not going to back out. Not at these points. There they are now. I just hope they're good for the money. Don't worry, they are. Come in. Come in. Oh, he's got us all excited, this idea you have. Yeah, it's going to be good. Anybody want coffee? Tea? Something stronger? Oh, I don't. No, neither do I. All right, then let's get down to cases. This gentleman... He's here because he's going to get to know you very well. All your moods, all your movements, even your thoughts, insofar as that's possible. I'm not going to tell you his name because you won't need it. You're better off without it. But he knows yours, and he knows where you live, where you work, where you play, in short, everything. Why? What for? Yeah, what's the point? He'll be your bodyguard in a rather unique way. That is, he won't protect you day to day, minute to minute, from attack. No, his function is to watch for any seriously threatening gesture from either one of you toward the other. Before the threatening one can go into action, he will kill you both. 
both. Kill us both? Yes, that's right. Well, what do you say? How about it? I I don't know what to say. It's, it's such a crazy idea. It's not so crazy. Well, I think it is. Both of us wind up dead? That wasn't what I had in mind. It's not what I have in mind either. I'm not wild about killing off people who haven't done anything. The point of this setup is to keep you both from doing something. That's what you wanted, isn't it? Well, yeah, but... Well, that's exactly what we wanted. Yeah, but I, I, I wouldn't kill her. Then why did you buy a gun? So you wouldn't kill me. I'd never kill you. Then why'd you buy a knife? Hold it. Hold it one cotton pick a minute. You know, I don't know as I want to bother with either of you. Why not? Why don't you? I don't know if you're worth it. If it wasn't for the money. But how much? Ask her. How much? Half of everything you've got. Half? Half of everything? I don't work cheap. I don't know. Half of it's everything. your lives we're talking about, not mine. Our lives? Both of them. But if you want to take chances. Go ahead. Be my guest. Well, do you? I don't. Neither do I. Okay, then. We start today. So it was settled. That was six weeks ago. And here I sit wondering if I was as clever as I thought, if anyone is so clever. What was it, Nietzsche said? If you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Well, that's the way I feel now. I stare into the unknown, and the unknown stares back. Still, when he reported to me two weeks later, he was almost flippant. It's a piece of cake. You mean that? They're on their best behavior. I got them scared to leave. You have? We have. Between you and me and the plan, they don't dare step an inch out of line. Either one of them. It's a shame to take the money. You've already taken it. And I mean to keep it. Now listen, I work hard for it. Every so often I remind them on the round. I stroll across their lawn and look in the window. Run into one or both of them out shopping. I tip my hat. I give them a look. Don't worry. They know I'm around. And that if they take one false step, it's the end. I have to hand it to you. I really do. It's a great plan. I couldn't have dreamed it up in a million years. No, you couldn't have. It's not that I'm stupid. Yes, it is. That's just what it is. You're stupid. Just a minute there. What efficient. Big and beautiful and superbly efficient. That's what I love about you. With my brains and your efficiency, we could go far. Don't you think? I don't know. I have to think about it. Offhand, I don't think it would work. Well, think about it. What good would it do for me to think about it if I'm stupid? Not that stupid. Look, I better be going. No, no, stay, please. Stay. Gotta get back on the job. They're quiet now. But who knows when one of them might flare up. All seemed to be going so well. Everything progressing according to plan. Both of them were so frightened for their own safety, their own lives. They were keeping a tight hold on their own passions. I had been right. The only solution was to keep them afraid to destroy lest they be destroyed. That fear, that dread, that horror was keeping them alive. And then a few weeks after his visit, the phone rang. Yes? Hello? Everything's changed. What? What do you mean? Things are heating up. What are you telling me? The whole plan is deteriorating. It's bad. Will you stop talking like that and tell me what's making you nervous all of a sudden? I'm not nervous. I'm never nervous. Well, you sound nervous. I've got a nerve in my body. That's why you hired me, isn't it? Why are you talking like this? What's going on? He went to an electrical supply house today. I saw him go in. I watched him through the window. Yes, go on. He bought some stuff. What kind of stuff? Fuse caps, detonators, electrical wire. You sure? I made sure. I went inside. Did he see you? No, not at first, but I was right about the stuff he bought. All he needs now is the explosive. To do what? Blow her up. A car, probably. But he hasn't made a move in that direction, has he? So far, the 
this whole thing could be your imagination. It could be. I thought of that. To be on the safe side, if there is a safe side. I stood near the door where he couldn't help but bump into me on his way out. And did he? He sure did. We were face to face, eye to eye. And he didn't flinch. Didn't back away. It was as though I didn't scare him one little bit. He was going to go ahead with what he had in mind. Whatever it was. Whatever. Oh, another thing. Remember she said he has a gun. I remember. Well, now she has one too. I saw it. That was two weeks ago and I haven't heard from him since. I've been sitting here with my unresponsive cat letting time sift through my fingers. She's staring at me now. Her yellow eyes never seem to blink. Is she trying to read her future in my face, or am I trying to read mine in hers? Perhaps I should call her Cassandra. After Cassandra, daughter of King Priam of Troy, to whom the god Apollo gave the gift of prophecy. And then when he grew angry with her decreed that though she could foretell the future, she should never be believed. What is the future, Cassandra? Will it be good or will it be evil? Tell me. What will it be? Let me in. Come in. Open the door. All right. I'm coming. Just a minute. Hurry up. Let me in. All right, for heaven's sake. I thought you'd never open come the door. Come in. Come in. Whatever's the matter with you? Look here. What have you got there? Take a look. It's a gun. It's hers. You told me on the phone she bought a gun. I wasn't too surprised. She had a knife. He had a gun. She wanted to even things up. That doesn't surprise me. No. Who does this? There's eight guns there. All of them loaded. Some of them are his. Some of them are hers. They're all over the house. In the bedroom. The living room. Even the kitchen. And, of course, a neat little revolver in the glove compartment of both their cars. You went through their house? What else was there to do? They were driving me crazy. They were starting to act as though I didn't exist. They ignored me. They treated me as though I was in their way. A nuisance. Something tiresome they ought to get rid of. Certainly they know they can't get rid of you. You're there for good. How could I be sure? Sure of what? That they couldn't get rid of me if they got together. But they wouldn't. They couldn't. You're what keeps them from killing each other. But they were getting to a point where they didn't care. Don't you understand that? They simply didn't care. They didn't care about anything except killing each other. In self-defense. That's what they said. That's what they said. They started to get crazy. I couldn't make any sense out of it. Were they buying guns and knives and fuses and dynamite to defend themselves with, or were they, were they buying them to kill? I got where I couldn't tell one from the other. They were mixed up together, and I couldn't sort it out. That's why I killed them. You what? I killed them. They were driving me mad, and I killed them. I never told you to do that. I don't have to take orders from you. But this means it's all been for nothing. It would have turned out this way anyhow, sooner or later. You don't know that. If you just kept on doing what you were hired to do... I couldn't. Not taking it on yourself to make a judgment you're not equipped to make. You've ruined it all. You've spoiled my perfect plan. What? That's gone down. You don't know how to use it. Oh, yes, I do. I had to do it. There was nothing else I could do. You understand I had no control over him, so I killed him. I had to. Didn't I, Cassandra? I did the right thing, didn't I? If you know the future, tell me I did the right thing. Tell me you'll agree. Tell me you'll approve. Tell me all will be well. Tell me you're not angry. Tell me you like me. Tell me you love me. Tell me. Ah! Ah! No! 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 Oh, no! No! Ah! 
Are you suggesting that the inscrutable cat actually killed the lady? That the future contains nothing but death and destruction? You could be right. Of course, you know that what we have just presented is in the nature of a fable, a parable, an allegory, perhaps even a morality tale. It was meant to reflect a part of the ultimate peril under which we all live, all of us, down to the last, the very last, man, woman, and child. I'll be back shortly. So we have returned to the concepts of Eros and Thanatos, which will triumph. We are faced with a stern injunction, love or perish, and the unbelievable possibility that man, in his infirmity and his helplessness, may embrace Thanatos rather than Eros, may choose to perish rather than love. Our cast included Elspeth Eric, Paul Hecht, Bernard Grant, and Maya Dillon. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. How about this on top? A red brocade coat? My hands. Oh. Oh, God. If I wipe them on this red coat, nothing will show. Oh. Ah. I'm going out of my senses. Ah, ah, good, good, good. A gold watch. Gold chain. Good. What's this? Bracelets. One, two, three. Dozens. These packages must be full of things pawned in the micro pocket they go. One after the other. Uh, oh, my Lord in heaven, sister, who killed you? Someone has come in. Two, take. Them also. This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Philosophers, scholars, and lawyers. Caesar put it one way, Seneca another, Sophocles had his words, Mark Twain and Tom Jefferson had theirs. If concerning those Anton Chekhov described in his stories, particularly in the mystery theater's tale of today. It is wrong for me to love you, Natasha. You are married, I am not. I should not have allowed our friendship to go this far. And if I were not married... But you are. And your husband is an exile here in Siberia. Could you love me if I had no husband? If I were a widow? How could that be? Unless you were to die. Perhaps that could be arranged. Man and the Devil, based on a story by Anton Chekhov, was adapted for the Mystery Theater by James Agatunia. It stars Alexander Scorby. I shall return shortly with Act One. Examine exile. From 15 to 50 years, in some Siberian outland, deprived of family and friends, left alone to survive or die. One man in the Russia of 1890s is the boatman who conveys the convicted across the river from Russia to Siberia. In the boatman's hut are two exiles. One, obviously a man of position, 
asleep in a fur coat, the other very poor and younger who warms his hands before the blazing logs. He is waiting to be ferried across the river by the boatman, whose name is Sasha. It is he who will tell our story. Young man, you have just arrived. At this moment, you feel sorry for yourself because you believe you are innocent. That gentleman, lying there asleep in his fur coat, also believes he is innocent and doesn't belong here in Siberia. His name is Vasily. Count Vasily, I believe. What's yours? My name is Radek. And mine is Sasha. I'm the boatman. I advise you to get as close to the fire as you can. When I take you across the river, you will find it very cold there. Sir, can a man be as well-dressed as that man, uh, Count Vasily, in a fur coat and still have committed a crime? He has been found guilty and exiled. How old are you? Twenty-five. What crime did you commit? I stole nothing. I robbed no one. I hurt no one. Uh, Whom did you offend? The state and the judge. Uh, uh, Russia is not a country where one may call a spade a spade, so to speak. There are those in power, and then there are the rest of us. Powerless. My boy, it has always been so. My wife, my baby, my parents. I, I, I can't bear to live without them. I shall go mad. You will not. We had a happy life. And then I was unjustly accused of of theft, of beating an old man. I broke out of jail and joined a movement of people. They told me there could be a better life. We all ended up in jail. In a worse life, hardly a life at all. You haven't even tasted it yet. You haven't crossed the river. As soon as the wind dies down, I shall row you across to be officially admitted at the post office at Girino. Don't you understand, old man? I can't accept this... this exile. Uh, How many thousands of times have I heard that? In a week, the river will have gone down, the weather will have warmed, and you will go wandering across Siberia, finding ways to amuse yourself. Never. Never. I shall die first. Oh, one doesn't die of loneliness. You will find a new life here. But I shall always be at this same place, living in this same hut, rowing back and forth across the river, as I have done for 20 years, day and night. White salmon and pike under the same water I float on. Sasha, why don't we go now, the... The wind seems less. Uh, are you waiting until he wakes up, our, our sleeping friend in his fur coat? No, not at all. Let him sleep the whole night and day, so far as I'm concerned. You wish to be ferried across now, so be it. Gather your belongings and we'll go. Who knows how long Mr. Fur Coat will sleep. You, Roddick, start your new life. Yes. As the Chinese say... A journey of a thousand leagues begins with the first step. How can you see in the dark? Experience. That enables everyone to see in the dark. Sir, is it true that once I've made a life for myself here and found work and and some way to live, I'll be permitted to have my family? My father is very ill now. My, my mother and wife promised if, if he should die, they'll come here if it's permitted. What's the use of having a mother and wife here? It's all foolishness, brother. The devil is tormenting you. The, the devil? Row harder. There's a treacherous undertow. <laughs> yes, I mean it. The devil, don't listen to him. Don't surrender to him. He whispers in your ear about women, say to him, I don't want them. There's no life here in Siberia for a woman. The accursed devil talks about freedom, say to him straight off, I don't want it. I don't understand. Not want freedom? I'm a young man. And a foolish one. I'm telling you the only way to exist as an outcast in Siberia is to want nothing. To torment yourself over nothing. No father, no mother, no sweetheart, no wife, no children, house or home. I speak that loudly to the devil every day. I don't want anything. Curse your soul. Yeah, here's the door. Follow that road where the sign points to Gino for ten kilometers. You will arrive there. The government 
office and the post office that is always open. Tell them you're here and to mark a check after your name. Mm-hmm. Is that all I do? <laughs> you are like a man who has come to the moon. Everything is strange. It is uninhabitable. You must learn from those who live there how one exists, find shelter, gain employment. Now, think of yourself as a lone pioneer. Uh, here, here. And keep this bottle with me. Take a swig. Oh, thank you. Oh, what a fine taste. Brother, I am no peasant. I don't come from a class of slaves. I'm the son of a sexton. Years ago, when I was a free man in Kursk, I wore a frock coat. But now I brought myself to such a point that I can sleep naked on the earth and eat grass. It is wanting nothing that enables one to survive in Siberia. From the very first day they sent me here. (laughs) Would you believe it? I don't even remember my crime. From that day, I wanted nothing. You had no family? You left no one behind? As many as you and more. Radek, don't complain. Don't envy. Find some joy in every day. Accept your lot. That is the secret. Take, for instance, that Vasily. Who? Oh, Count Vasily likes to call himself wealthy, well-educated. The man we left snoring in front of my fire in his fur coat. He will not find peace either until he accepts completely the life he has to live. I'm going back across the river now, and I shall tell him that for the umpteenth time. But do you think he'll take my advice? I doubt it. Ah, Vasily. I see you're awake now. Yes, I'm surprised you're back so soon, Sasha. Tell me, you're spending this entire night here in my hut, or do you expect me to ferry you back tonight? Well, I've waited this long. I thought I'd wait a little longer. She said she'd write by the first post. She promised to. Your wife could have addressed a letter to the Guillermo post office. Uh, but she knows it saves a day if her letter from Moscow comes to the boatman. Uh, that young man you just took across, I uh, suppose he's like all the others, isn't he? Uh, I didn't think you were asleep, I see. <laughs> he reminded me of you when you were first exiled to Siberia. Of me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that boy hasn't two kopecks to rub together. I was a government official. I had money. Uh, If you remember correctly, I agreed with everything you told me, Sasha, and I made a life for myself here. I bought a house and some land. No more a life of pushing papers across a desk as I did in Moscow. Yes, in the beginning you were fine. But your family had money. Yes, I think I'll wait just one more day for her letter. I'll go back to sleep then. Mm. I'll wake you in the morning. Yes, uh, when you walked in the door now, I was dreaming it was yesterday. (laughs) Perhaps I shall return to that dream, huh? You're letting the devil torture you. I can't help myself. I can't. Those dreams of the past. (laughs) It was almost as if I was dreaming by his side. I knew Vasily's dream so well. I warned him that to want money is only the beginning. His family had it, and so they could send it. Every month he would cross the river with me for a whole year. Every month. Always the same words. Uh, Sasha, it's a long time since they sent me any money from home. You don't need money, Vasily. What good is it? Throw all the past away. Forget it as though it never happened. Don't listen to the devil. He'll never bring you any good. He'll only tighten the noose. Oh, it's to want to live well in a place the Almighty has forsaken. Is that dealing with the devil? You are a prisoner, a convict. You have been convicted of a crime. One doesn't live well as a criminal. Now you want money. Every month. You wait for your family to send more. My crime was not that great. I forged my father's will so I wouldn't have to share with my brothers. (laughs) And those same brothers you tried to cheat 
I'm now sending you money. Uh, yes, I, I need it to live. I cannot live without money. To live, a man needs only to be content and happy. And if you wish to be content in Siberia, you must learn not to want anything. You have to despise fate. Laugh in his face. Then fate will begin laughing at himself. It was like talking to the wind. But see, he would hear none of it. He would have money. He would have his wife and daughter. He would turn his Siberia into a heaven on earth. And for two years this went on. For two years I ferried him to the Russian side of the river... And one day, that man, that Vasily Sergeyevich, met me with laughter. Ah, ah! Oh, ho, ho, Sasha! It happened! It happened! Think of it, Sasha! She is coming! She is! I am going to give you not tomorrow. Would you believe it? To meet my wife. Oh, my Natasha. She has taken pity on me. She's come to live with me. Ah! Oh. She has forsaken the gay life of Moscow to live here in Siberia. Bad winters and all. And to be with me. She misses me. What do you think of that, Sasha? You have a devoted wife, is what I said to him. But in my heart, I knew. Wives and prisoners of the state... I knew it could not last. Many have written about the Gulag. The outcasts of Russian society condemned to mark time until their sentence has been served, or they have not survived and died in their cages. But no one has illuminated it in the same fashion as Chekhov. What it takes to become used to this moonscape from which there is no escape. Our boatman will tell us more when I return shortly with Act Two. Man, who ferries prisoners from Russia to Siberia, tried to soften the blows of this strange new existence to those who were about to enter this barren land. Sometimes he would talk to the new convicts in his hut before the fire. Sometimes during the long road to that land of the abandoned and forgotten. One prisoner, Vasily Sergeyevich, having served two years of his sentence for forgery, has persuaded his young wife and daughter to come live with him in Siberia. Sasha picks up the story. The next day, Vasily arrived with his wife, a pretty young lady with a little girl in her arms and lots of luggage, hat boxes and boxes of shoes. Vasily Sergeyevich was spinning about her like a top. Natasha, this is my old friend, Sasha. She has made life bearable for me here. Uh, uh, Sasha is the boatman, our only link with civilization. Uh, Sasha, this is my wife. This delightful, beautiful creature. Uh, now, how often have I spoken of her, huh? Hmm? Yes, madam, he has often. Often uh, and glowingly. And deservedly, too. Eh? What? Uh, imagine leaving the comforts of home and friends to spend goodness knows how much time in Siberia with her loving husband. But I shall make a home for her, the likes of which even Moscow cannot begin to equal. Eh, Sasha? Huh? <laughs> Certainly, if anyone can transform this wilderness, it will be your husband, madam. Oh, and my little one, whom I haven't seen since she was a babe in arms. <laughs> now, uh, how are we going to transport all this luggage aboard that little skiff of yours, huh? I shall make as many trips across the river as necessary. <laughs> you see? Problems, solutions. Didn't I write to you, Natasha? Nothing but the best people here. People with heart, with love. Oh, you will enjoy yourself, I promise. Now, come, come, come. Let us all get aboard Sasha's ferry and make the first trip. He was breathless with joy. I thought, 
All right. Be happy today, Vasily. You won't always be showing such a happy face to the world. From that time on, he went every week to the post office to find out where the money was being sent from Russia. <laughs> that wife of his, Natasha, needed a lot of money. Vasily, eh? will you please stop walking up and down the room? Well, I'm, please. I'm only thinking, Natasha, is there a special post on Saturdays, or do I have to wait until Monday? I, I you are making me very nervous pacing up and down like that. I can barely make up my face. Oh, I hope this party you're giving, I don't know, as whole. I hope that it's more amusing than the last two. The people here are so boring. Oh, no, no, all new people. No, I promise you they're, they're all in government. Well, I prefer artists. Oh, my darling, we are meeting the best people, and they're all charmed by you. I am not charmed by them, the people you have no manners. Haven't you noticed? And you, too. You have become somewhat crude and boring like the rest of them. How I long to meet just one gentleman, just one. I ask no more. Oh, I have become crude and boring. Yes, just like them. Oh, Vasily, you don't even realize it. But uh, Siberia... You... I know, I know. For others, it is a prison. But you assured me in your letters that for us it would not be. And we are paying for your indiscretion, Vasily. It's not fair. Every day to be surrounded by riffraff and barbarians. Uh, no, no, that, that is not entirely so, Natasha. There, there are gentlemen here, and some of them have even invited you to go hunting. But I am not interested in hunting. Besides, for a woman alone, it's not proper. Well, government officials and commissars and their wives hunt. It, it is only we, not you, but I, a prisoner who may not carry a gun. Well, you went on the last hunt. I didn't hear any objections then. You acted as though you had a very good time. You don't understand anything. Month after month, my child is longing for a proper education. I, I, I ask myself, why did I come to Siberia in the first place? Well, why? I, I thought... You that thought was... what? Well, I... never mind. But I do mind. What were you going to say? No. I thought you came here because you missed me and loved me and wished our little family to be together. But I can say I was mistaken. I am exiled not only from my country but from everything that was once dear to me. Siberia is a cruel punishment. It does not fit the crime. How long could a spoiled wife of a once wealthy man exiled to Siberia stand it here? Not very long. How could she? Clay soil on which nothing grows, cold water, cold weather, no vegetables, no fruit, and surrounded by ignorant people. So she found amusement where she could. Anton? Oh, forgive me, my princess. I could not come sooner. Anton, where have you been? I've missed you so. Well, a commissar cannot always prescribe his hours. I have work responsibilities. Anton? I hate this place. Even my little Anna knows how I feel. And although she loves her father and would do anything to remain here in Siberia with him, she knows it is not good for her. So we had a little talk. And I am going to take her home to Moscow. She is too young to stop learning. In Moscow? When? At the first sign of spring, April or perhaps May. Now you will come too, won't you? I, I cannot leave here. This is my post, my uh, my career, my future. I, I have no way of going to Moscow in the spring. I am taking Anna to Moscow. And as soon as I am certain that she is installed in a good school and her uncle can take care of her, I may return. And then what? We shall see. If you are still interested, I will be with you. Someone who can make Siberia bearable for me. And if not you, then someone else. Oh, crumbs of happiness. It's all wrong. You are married. I am not. I, I, I should not have allowed our friendship to go this far. Would you feel that way if I were alone? Alone? If I had no husband? If I were a widow? Well... <sighs> Then I would demand to be transferred to Moscow. I, I would pester them until they agreed. They, in Moscow, we could be married. They, they like my work. I, I know I should be promoted. Natasha, 
Would you marry me if, if you were a widow? Yes, I would. I believe in you, Anton. So only one thing stands in our way. Yes, only one thing. Am I to remain the wife of an exile or his widow? Anton, you're an excellent shot. Remember those geese you shot down, one after the other, without scarcely taking aim? Tomorrow I shall tell Vasily that for her sake I am taking Anna back to Moscow. And perhaps, who knows? While I am away, a hunt is organized and accident happens. So that when I return, I find myself a widow. A hunting accident. <laughs> How long will you be away? I can arrange almost anything. How much time do you need? And did it happen exactly as it was planned? No, not exactly. Do you remember the young Radek I took across the river some years ago? Well, he had become quite desperate. He saw no way of living out his sentence and never seeing his wife again. He came to me and told me of his plan. To run away. As simple as that. Mm. And you think they won't find you? Well, I shall run quickly. Mm -hmm. You have clothes enough? Mm -hmm. Only what is on my back. Food enough? At night, if I'm near a farmhouse, I can steal food. Uh, how did this change of mind come about? Sasha, I, I can make no money. I, I can get no money. I have no place to which to bring my wife. <laughs> Not many have. Vasily Sergeyevich has. Well... He could bring his wife and daughter to this frozen hell. For three years, they've been here with him. Three whole years. I would give anything. Anything for my wife to visit me for just one day. One day only. And then she could go home. One visit would last me a whole year. Sasha, I have decided to suffer no longer. Uh, what if they catch you? And they will catch you. Your clothes are ragged. You have no papers. Every citizen has papers. Uh, how many years was your sentence? Ten. I, I cannot live for another seven. A young, strong man like you. Too long ago, I stopped counting the days. I began to think of death. You are 25. I'm 28 now. I was 25 when I first came here. I'm still twice your age. It is not Siberia that is making you ill. It is the devil. Sasha, you have said all this to me before. I can find no work here. No place to live. I was born a peasant, but I educated myself. I learned to read books. Then death is not for you. I tell you, Radek, you can make a life for yourself here. Forget yesterdays. Live only for today. I cannot. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a mouthful from my bottle. It'll cheer you. She was... She was only 17. My old girl. When we married, I must see her once before I die. You won't die. Tell the devil to let you alone. Scream at him. Take control of your life. Yes, yes, that is what I shall do tomorrow. Tomorrow I shall run away. How far will you get? They have dogs. Why tomorrow, huh? Well, there's a hunt tomorrow. Ducks, geese, pheasants. I, I heard them talking about it. Vasily Sergeyevich was boasting he was going to be allowed to accompany the hunters. You see, he said to me what it means to have connections. I said to him, I, I, I was incredulous. They are giving you a convict a gun to shoot with? No, but they are trusting me to carry the gun. Radek, they will find you with their dogs. Sasha, that's the beautiful part. The dogs will be hunting too. I shall hide in the trees, and when they're all occupied with shooting birds, I shall run as fast as I can. The Lord be with you. I hope you will arrive at the place you wish to. Poor Adit. He never left the forest alive. He was shot by accident by one of the government men. One called Anton. He said he thought the movement behind a tree was a deer. That it never occurred to him it could be an escaping convict. Anton, you are back. 
I had no idea you would return to Moscow so soon. I didn't go. Anna became ill. Is that the man you shot? They're burying? It was an accident. The wrong accident. Vasily told me all about it. He was standing quite near when you shot the wrong man. I shouldn't have even dreamed of doing it. This innocent boy is dead now. They said he was escaping. Did you shoot the wrong man on purpose? I don't know what I did. It was all so sudden. It was wicked to even plan such a thing. How could we have lived together with your husband's death on our conscience? That boy died so that Vasily could live. We must never forget that. Now, let us bow our heads as they lower the coffin into the grave. souls. One cannot help wondering, is this happening today? Stories of injustice finally filter through the darkness and we hear of them. Sane men who are placed in institutions for the mad. Those who disappear and are never heard from again. And our story is based on an account published 120 years ago. History repeats itself again and again. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Today, the mystery theater's third act curtain rises on a tale familiar to many writers. Some who themselves experienced exile in Siberia. We have used Chekhov's account written in 1892 because we hope by 1992 that such bestiality towards man will be forgotten history. Our spokesman is Sasha, the boatman, the link between freedom and living death. He himself is in exile. Fifty? Sixty? No one quite knows. And strangely enough, he has forgotten whether he has served out his sentence. For he has remade his life here in Siberia. I stand in a corner of the yard where the dead are placed. It is so cold they cannot dig very deep. Anton, the man in love with a prisoner's wife, has shot and killed the young man who lies in that coffin. From the distance, the bell of death. I should have known. Natasha, I ask you to observe the ceremony and contain yourself. Coward. 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 You shot the other man on purpose. You couldn't bring yourself to do away with Vasily. Your old words. I've wasted my love on you. Natasha, for the Lord's sake, stop whispering to me. There's a burial going on. Someone will see you. They will suspect something. Not only a coward, but a fool. Vasily still lives. My daughter Anna refuses to go to school in Moscow and leave her father. My life is all upside down. Yours goes on as if nothing has happened and nothing has touched you. I was a fool to think that you could free me. Please let me explain all this to there you later. There is nothing to explain, coward. I never want to see you again. I thought of Radek, the poor boy who meant no harm to anyone. Who was caught in a chain of circumstances and now would never see his Olga or his mother or his cherished province of Sibirsk. Six months later, a troika drove up outside my hut, and the driver just sat there. I spoke to him, but he said nothing. Someone had hired him, and he was waiting. And then there was some shouting from the other bank. You! Heyman! Boltzmann! We wish to get across! Well, I brought them across. It was Anton. Even though it was dark, I recognized him with his tortoiseshell glasses. 
There was a lady with him all bundled up, but I recognized her, too. They had some luggage, not much. They got into the Troika, and that was the last I ever saw of them. The next morning, guess who was shouting to be ferried across? Let's see, you said Gage on his best horse. Is this as fast as you can move this old cub uh, across? Vasily, Vasily, you have a horse that's quite a weight as well. You helped him get across, didn't you? They could have only come this way. Who? My wife. And the young gentleman with the spectacles. Yes, I brought them across last night. And the boxes and cases? They uh, had some luggage. Yeah. Oh, no, you should have told me. It would have been nothing for you to row across and find me and tell me my wife had run away. Oh, Vasily, be sensible. How would I know such a thing? I had no idea she was running away. <laughs> you sure? Yes, I am sure. Oh, what of your daughter, Anna? Uh, Anna is still with me, thank the Lord. <laughs> What happened when they got to the other side, huh? Oh, they were whisked off in a troika. Yes, well, I shall find them. I have a fast horse. I shall bring her back with me. Five days and nights he chased after his wife. Of course, he didn't find her. I won't rest. I won't. I will have her back. I will have my freedom. I must. Who do I see to beg for my freedom? You know all the influential people in Guineo. You entertain them at your house. Whom do I know? They are all leeches and traitors. Is there an honest official among them? Uh, go speak to Pyotr Vishnevsky. Tell him you're an old friend of Sasha's. He may help. Summers and winters passed. Don't ask me how many. Time expands and compresses in this wilderness. But I remember standing in the post office one day. The door was open. I walked into an office. And there was Pyotr Vishnevsky. Sasha, your beard has grown quite white. <laughs> You're bald as a hen's egg. <laughs> Good to see you after all this time. Yeah. You're still in the customs office, huh? Eh? Well, they have made me the chief. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Surely you must have served your sentence by this time. Yes, I probably have, but where would I go? Most of my life has been lived here. Mm. What would I go back to? <laughs> I can hardly remember what I did before I became the boatman. You know that man you sent me eight years ago, did Vasily Sergeyevich? Oh, Vasily, yes. I haven't seen him and I don't know how long. He never comes across the river. Oh, well, he has sold his land, mortgaged his house. Today, if you saw him, Sasha. WWJ News Time now, 1148. Uh, WWJ's Rob Marr has this important update on Chrysler contract talks. Rob? Well, the midnight deadline is fast approaching, but there is not going to be a break off of talks in Canada and the United States. They have recessed talks with Chrysler. They're going back at it in the morning. There will be uh, Douglas Frazier and Mark Stepp are not optimistic, but they are not pessimistic. They will be still trying to resolve the impasse that has had Canadian workers on the picket line for nearly five weeks. We'll have an update at midnight. Rob Marr, WWJ. Now back to Mystery Theater. I've never been to Siberia. Oh, I still do. Sasha. Did you say Sasha? Oh, my goodness. How long has it been? Of course, I never cross the river anymore. We, we very simply, Anna and I, you know my daughter, Anna. I would have recognized her anywhere. Oh, how would you have recognized her? She was a little one in those days. <laughs> I was very little when you met me first, but I'm 18 now. Oh, Sasha, Sasha, do you still talk about the devil? Huh? Oh, <laughs> sometimes, yes. Yeah. Well, for a man who knows as much as you, you were very wrong. Was he really, Papa? Well, weren't you, Sasha? Come, come, come. You're among friends. Come, come, confess it. What do you want me to say? And I am the proof you were wrong. After everything you said and done, I am the living proof that people can live in Siberia. That even in Siberia, there is happiness. Ah, look at her. Anna, 
There, she stands. Oh, Papa. She takes good care of you. We are counting the months now. Oh, a little less than a year and my sentence is over. We're full of plans, my little Anna and I. One more winter and that will be it. Piotr, I saw him. I saw them both. Vasily and Anna? Yes, he speaks of life after Siberia. He's older than I and she's 18. What happiness can she have with her father now? And he loves her and finds consolation. Well, like any father who regains his lost youth through his daughter. What she wants is caresses and laughter and perfumes. Isn't that so, Piotr? <laughs> A normal girl. It won't last. It cannot last. <laughs> It won't even begin. I didn't realize how prophetic my words could be. I didn't see them then for months at a time. The frost was beginning, the signal of a very hard winter. The ice forming on the river. What happened, Vasily? What do you mean? Oh, well, here it is, winter already. It was last spring, remember? So you and Anna outside the church. She was so happy and dancing about. Reminded me so of her mother. Well, the whole summer's passed. You said you'd pay me a visit. Uh, things have not gone as well as I'd hoped. I have been troubled. We have both been troubled. Yeah, I could have told you. Uh, you know nothing. No, no, no. Let us not quarrel. I, I've heard of your sorrow. I don't wish to add to it. You said you could have told me. What did you mean? I could not have foreseen everything, but some things, yes. <sighs> Sasha, Sasha. Are you saying to me what happened was because of the life here in Siberia? Did you know I came to your door often and knocked? And no one would open the door? I, I ran everywhere to find doctors. I, I could have been out when you knocked. Yeah. Well, my friend Piotr told me. He said Anna withered and wasted away until she was too weak to stand on her feet. Yes, it happened almost overnight. I spent a fortune on doctors. They all shook their heads. They, they, they could do nothing. Yeah, yeah, consumption, I know. That's your Siberian happiness for you. No fruits, no vegetables, no sunshine, no life. You kept her in prison with you as you tried to keep her mother. Ah, that must be it, the load I'm supposed to row back to the other side. There are four, four men carrying it. Yes, Anna's coffin. I will ride across with you. Oh, forgive me. I, I had no idea. Uh-huh. They told me there would be a load to carry across the river. I had no idea it was her. What will you do, Vasily? I'm... Taking Anna to Moscow. Uh, and then? Nothing. My life is over. Vasily, we're both of the same age. Come back. Be a boatman with me. It's a healthy outdoor life. We could live to be a hundred. I have a cousin in the Urals who is a hundred and twenty-five. And could come back. You could help those who are making this passage for the first time. We will share life, you and I. We will not let the devil rule us. We will rule him. Let me think about it, Sasha. You may be right. But I may not have the strength to return. I never saw Vasily Sergeyevich again. Uh, did he do away with himself from grief? Did he run away? Why did he not return here? Some men are difficult to understand. Today, when I introduced our production of The Boat Man and the Devil, I pondered a little bit upon justice and judgment. I wondered then, and I still do, whether justice... A man-made law of order can ever exist in a form acceptable to everyone? Putting it in our terms, is it because, as someone has said, 
No one understands the policeman because no one understands the Bill of Rights. I shall return shortly. A postscript about the boatman, whom I'm sure many have already likened to Charon, the ferryman of the dead, guiding their bodies across the river Styx. For the fare of one silver piece, Charon would ferry his soul to eternity. Surely, man could do better than bring others to eternal death, the death of places like Siberia. Were my opinion to be asked, I would banish forever. Exile. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Marion Seldes, Russell Horton, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Thank you for the coffee. Well, you're very welcome. Come back sometime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, why, why did you ask him to come back? I don't know. He looks so, un, so unhappy. So haunted. Yeah, so screwy is more like him. <gasps> Look. He's coming back. He's turned around and he's coming back. Good Lord. Now, don't be mean to him, Charles. Please don't be mean to him. I won't. Uh, well... Uh, uh, forget something? Please. Please. Don't make me leave. Don't make me go away. I have to stay here. It's important. Believe me. It's very, very important that I should stay here. This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams.